Sergeant, so you can begin your recording. And Mr. Bradley, I will leave it to you. Okay. Hello, you hear me? Okay, good afternoon and welcome to today's New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Immigration. At this time, would all panelists please turn on your videos. To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices on vibrate or silent mode. If you wish to testify, you may send a testimony at testimony at council.nyc.gov. Again, it's testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. We're ready to begin. Thank you. I call this hearing to order and I wanna thank uh, you for joining our virtual hearing for the Committee on Immigration. I'm Carlos Menchaca, Chair of the New York City Council's Committee on Immigration. Today, the committee will be examining immigrant exclusion in COVID-19 response. Additionally, the committee will be hearing six resolutions. And I would also like to acknowledge my other colleagues who have joined us here today. Uh, I see Councilmember Moya, I see Councilmember Drum, uh, and Public Advocate Jumani Williams is here as well. And uh, is there anybody else? Councilmember Eugene is here. Wonderful. Um, thank you for joining and, and any other members that I missed, I'll bring them back uh, later today. The resolutions before the committee are the following. Resolution number 1399, sponsored by myself, calls on the New York State Legislature to pass and the governor to sign A10433 and S5167, which would allow for the state agencies, municipalities and authorities to provide state or local public benefits, regardless of immigration status. Resolution number 1404, sponsored by public advocate Jamani Williams, calls on the United States Department of Justice to issue guidance that establishes protocols for the Executive Office of Immigration Review in times of public health crisis, such as the SARS COVID-2 outbreak. Resolution 1416 by Council Member Matthew Eugene calls on the United States Department of Homeland Security to halt all deportation proceedings for the length of COVID-19 pandemic and as a means of restricting the global spread of this disease. Resolution 1417 by Council Member Matthew Eugene, calling on the Department of Homeland Security to place a moratorium on all removal proceedings for employment-based status holders that suffered a loss of employment during or due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Resolution 1418 by Councilmember Matthew Eugene, calling on the United States Congress to pass and the president to sign legislation that would permit employment-based status holders to retain lawful status after loss of employment if such loss was related to the COVID-19 pandemic. And finally, Resolution 1419 by Councilmember Moya, calling on the United States Congress to pass and the president to sign legislation that would provide immigration relief for family members who derive lawful immigration status from a frontline worker who passed away due to COVID-19. Um, and at this point, I'd like to ask Councilmember Moya to speak on his resolution um, before I talk about mine. Councilmember Moya, are you ready? Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much for allowing me uh, the opportunity to go first. I appreciate it. Uh, and thank you so much for your thoughtfulness on uh, all of the great resolutions that we have here in front of us. Uh, good, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today, we will hear several critical resolutions calling on the state and federal government to heed the call to help some of uh, our most vulnerable and hardest hit by the COVID crisis um, that have been left in the cold. My resolution number 1419 calls on the United States Congress to pass and the president to sign legislation that would provide immigration relief for family members who derive lawful immigration status from a frontline worker who has passed away due to COVID-19. 
nationally uh, foreign born individuals account for a large share of essential workers, including 17% of the healthcare workforce, while in New York, the foreign born share of healthcare workforce is more than twice that of the national average. In fact, in New York, 47% of hospital medical staff and more than 79% of home health aides are foreign born across the five boroughs. A large portion of foreign born frontline workers in the healthcare profession are present in the United States on non-immigrant employment based visas, which are restrictive and require individuals to reapply should circumstances warrant any changes of employment. Certain nuclear family members may derive visas from a primary non-immigrant visa holder, but if the primary visa holder passes away, then all the family members on the derived visa uh, must return to their countries of origin. In many cases, families on such visas have established lives in the United States with employment, schooling, and connections to local communities that make it very difficult to uproot and return to their countries of origin. It is imperative that Congress enact legislation uh, to ensure that families do not lose their lawful status as a result of the fatal contraction of COVID-19 by their frontline working family members. Uh, we cannot turn our backs on the families of those who stepped up in our country's time of need, those who acted as heroes, and we need to honor and protect them. And I thank you, Chair, for the opportunity uh, to have this resolution be introduced today. Thank you very much. Thank you for that for that work on, on that resolution. And I'm also looking forward to hearing from public about, about all the resolutions. Uh, at this time, I'd also like to ask public uh, advocate Jamani Williams to speak on his legislation. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, as was mentioned, my name is uh, Jamani Williams and a public advocate for the city of New York. Again, I wanna thank uh, Chairman Chaka and the members of the committee on immigration for holding this very important hearing today on the exclusion of immigrants in the COVID-19 response and a series of resolutions, including one with, of mine. Uh, I would also like to thank Commissioner uh, Bita Mostafi for attending this hearing to provide information on what your office is doing to help our immigrant community. Today, the committee will hear resolutions calling on the state and federal government to provide protections to immigrants in the wake of COVID-19. I support all of my colleagues' efforts and I commend them for introducing these pieces of legislation. In response to the impact that the coronavirus has had on our health and our economy, our city, state, and federal government has taken steps to ensure that people continue to receive an income, live without fear of being evicted, and access testing for COVID-19. Yet, immigrant communities have been largely left out of relief efforts that would protect their health and well-being. These issues were evident when the pause executive order went into effect in March, and there was no immediate guidance on immigration court proceedings. My resolution 1404 calls on the United States Department of Justice to issue guidance and establish protocols for the Executive Order of Immigration Review, or EOIR. During public health crises such as the SARS CoV 2 outbreak, these resolutions uh, stem from a letter written in March to the director of EOIR from more than 100 legal service providers in New York, where they voiced their concerns of clients' health being put at risk due to requirement to still attend court proceedings. Removal hearings were never paused during this pandemic, increasing the risk of being ordered to leave the United States simply for failing to appear in court. Attorneys feared their clients would continue appearing in overcrowded courtrooms, even if they were exhibiting symptoms of the coronavirus. The concerns of legal providers were justified. The EOIR did not issue a clear guidance on how to handle court proceedings in the onset of the shelter in place, which subsequently compromised the health and safety of respondents, their attorneys, witnesses, members of their household, agency staff members, and core of immigration judges, not to mention the entire city itself. To make matters worse, there were reports that posters on proper hand washing and other preventative health measures were ordered to be removed from the hallways of immigration court. It is very likely that this absence of a guidance and structure contributed to the rise in positive coronavirus cases during the peak of the pandemic. As of now, the EOIR has posted a public health notice on their website with precautionary measures. The notice instructs individuals to wear a face covering to enter and remain in the EOIR space, not to enter if they have symptoms or a diagnosis of COVID-19, to practice social distancing and to practice proper hygiene by washing hands with soap and water or using alcohol-based sanitizer. While I appreciate the agency's efforts in posting this information on their website and making it available in 15 languages, albeit several months too late, this only addresses part of the problem. There are all still there are still two there are still no clear instructions and options for filing documentation electronically, which means many respondents and their attorneys 
attorneys still have no choice but to attend in-person proceedings. Advocates and public defenders have expressed their frustration at the size limit of the EOIR's e-filing, and the agency has said itself that it cannot provide technical support or confirmation that electronic filings have permitted for ongoing cases. There is a clear technical problem in the agency's operations that they have yet to fix. Last, but definitely not least, there is an apparent absence of oversight in ensuring that each EOIR office across the country is following the same set of standards for filing procedures, information distribution, and hygienic practices. Citizenship of status may be a legal matter, but no human is illegal. Therefore, it is our responsibility as elected officials to protect the health of every individual inside our borders. We do this by making sure everyone has access to information in their native language, that paperwork can easily be filed electronically as we are still confined to a virtual world and that no one has to sacrifice their health to remain in this country. So I just wanna say thank you. I sadly don't expect much uh, from this particular administration, but I'm glad that we have uh, people on this call and I'm thankful the, the chair uh, of this committee for their leadership and doing what we can to protect all of our residents. Thank you. Uh, thank you, public advocate for your advocacy on this. And when the city uh, council passes this, it'll have the, the strength and power of the, of, of the city of New York behind it. Uh, thank you. And we can hear from council member Matthew Eugene on your resolutions. Thank you very much, Chairman Cheka, for your leadership of the immigration committee during this very difficult time for all New Yorkers. And I also want to commend and thank you, along with my colleagues on the Immigration Committee for helping us protect the immigrant community against the spread of COVID-19. As a public servant representing a majority immigrant uh, in the, my district in the Brooklyn, I am all too aware of the challenges and risk posed uh, within our immigration system pertaining to the proper treatment of the deportees during the COVID-19 pandemic. There remains a major concern that the deportees who may have contracted the COVID-19 are put in danger of spreading this horrible disease upon their return to their country of origin unless more stringent safety measures are put in place. That is why I mean, I'm sponsoring Resolution 1416 calling on the United States Department of Homeland Security to all, all deportation precedents for the length of the COVID-19 pandemic as a means of restricting the international transmission of this disease. We know that the Department of Homeland Security has already put in place measures that they feel are appropriate to prevent again the spread of COVID-19. But as with any infectious disease that has, has the ability to mutate and change its pathophysiology, it is important that we take more precaution, precautions with deportees so that their transport does not become an even greater health risk to the country they are returning to. I believe this is a necessary measure that must be adopted by the Department of our Homeland Security in order to maintain the health and the well-being of the United States, as well as the global community. In addition, I'm sponsoring Resolution 1417, calling on the United States the Homeland Security to place a moratorium in all removal proceedings for employment-based status holders that suffered a loss of employment during or due to COVID-19 pandemic as well as resolution 1418, is legislation that will permit employment-based status holders to remain lawful status after loss of employment if such loss was related to COVID-19 pandemic. This public health crisis has put a spotlight on the hard work and labor of our immigrant workers, many of whom are our cab drivers, essential workers, health professionals, and small business owners. They are the strength of our local economy and they risk their life to keep our city and our country moving forward during the worst part of this pandemic. Now, 
it is time when we must do everything that we can, when we must do what is right to continue to protect our immigrant community from losing the legal status and facing removal proceeding due to circumstances beyond their control. And I want to thank uh, Abani Ayuja, Elizabeth Crow, Florentine Kabori, Jeff Baker, Brian Crow, and all those wonderful colleagues, whether they are staff of the city council or my colleagues in uh, government as city council member, I want to thank all of you for your effort, for your dedication, for your passion to continue to protect the immigrants uh, community. And to you, uh, Chairman Shaka, thank you so much for your leadership. Thank you for your dedication and your passion in protecting our immigrant people because they make United States what United States is about. They make New York City, New York City, and we cannot do nothing without them. Thank you so very much. And uh, God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Matthew Eugene from Brooklyn. And those are the sponsors. And I just wanna say how proud I am of this council and all the staff that have worked on these resolutions. I'm gonna speak on my resolution, but as you can see, the immigration committee has been hard at work really responding to this crisis uh, when it comes to our immigrant communities. On the reso that I'm introducing in 1399, I do not want to under, understate the meaning of this legislation currently being considered by the state legislature. We could be the first state in the nation to allow eligibility for state and local public benefits to be extended to all state residents, regardless of immigration status. Many advocates have asked the council to fund direct cash assistance for immigrant New Yorkers during the pandemic. And this bill would not only allow us to provide this, it would be even more far reaching. <coughs> New York City could provide safety net benefits to all residents, regardless of immigration status. In January, having no idea what lay before us, I opened our first committee hearing of the year by underscoring my firm belief that when we discuss policies to care for our sick, protect our neighbors from bad landlords, or better educate our children, we are necessarily talking about immigrant New Yorkers. In this committee, as we have overseen the city's efforts to make life better, safer, and more affordable for all, we ask questions about how all policies affect immigrant New Yorkers, not because they are a special class to consider, but because they are New Yorkers. I and this committee have been focused on highlighting the gaps in services that immigrant New Yorkers face. And just in the past two years, we have discussed how immigrant New Yorkers often fear accessing healthcare due to cruel federal policies, such as public charge. We have discussed the lack of adequate mental health services for immigrant communities and how to support immigrant run small businesses. We received data in annual reports from the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs that highlights the disparities in health insurance, overcrowded living arrangements, and rent burden, and poverty in, in immigrant communities. And in these past six months, we have seen how all of these disparities have contributed to the disproportionate devastation the COVID-19 pandemic has brought on our immigrant neighbors. Today, we are here to discuss lessons learned, what we need to do better to prepare for potential of a second wave of COVID and how we can begin to envision a recovery. While immigrants are disproportionately contracting COVID-19 and suffering fatal infections, with many dying in their homes in the spring, they were entirely forgotten by federal and state government entities. And at the local level, clear and appropriate messaging regarding the virus and city services were disseminated unevenly, unevenly often late and in insufficient languages. Trusted voices from community-based organizations were suddenly unable to provide many of the services in person, told they were not considered essential for the purposes of contract reimbursement, or had to find new ways to reach their service population, many of whom lack digital literacy. In terms of labor, immigrants were overrepresented in some of the industries that are vital to the COVID-19 pandemic response working high rates in occupations within the healthcare, manufacturing, and agricultural fields, and keeping essential businesses like grocery stores and pharmacies open amidst the crisis. 
immigrants were also overrepresented in some of the highest hit industries, including hospitality and food services, construction work, and domestic work, which suffered mass layoffs. I would be remiss if I didn't also mention that before our city was struggling to survive the full surge of the virus, a wave of anti-Asian racism took root, affecting New Yorkers across the five boroughs. At the same time, the federal government has not slowed down its deportation program or substantially altered its approach to criminalizing and detaining our own. This virus and the many ways it has infiltrated our communities and upended our lives will be with us for a very long time to come. And it is critical that we take stock of where we are and how we are surviving it right now and what more we can do to ensure that immigrant New Yorkers are integral to the city's recovery plan. I look forward to hearing from many of you uh, who are here today. We're gonna hear from a, a panel before we hear from the mayor's office, but I expect to hear opportunities for collaboration and continued work with this administration. And while the current crisis is far from over, and as our minds are set beyond 2020, the ways in which our city is now recovering were also impossible to envision in April and in May. And that gives us me, that gives me hope because I wanna thank my staff who has continued to understand this, uh, Committee Council Harbani Ausha, Policy Analyst Elizabeth Kronk, Chief of Staff Lorena Lucero, Legislative Director Cesar Vargas, and my Communications Director Tony Chirito. Uh, and with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Committee Council Harbani Ausha to go over some procedural items and... Thank you, Chair. My name is Herbani Ahuja and I'm counsel to the Committee on Immigration for the New York City Council. Before we begin, I wanna remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify when you will be unmuted by the host. I will be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called. I will be periodically announcing who the next panelist will be. The first panel will consist of members of the public. Next, we will hear from members of the administration followed by advocates and additional members of the public. All hearing participants should submit tes written testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov. I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, we will be calling on individuals one by one to testify. Each panelist will be given three minutes to speak. Please begin once the sergeant has started the timer. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the raise hand function in Zoom and I will call on you after the panelist has completed their testimony. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant at Arms will give you the go ahead to begin upon setting the timer. Please wait for the Sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. We have an interpreter that will be providing simultaneous interpretation in Spanish during this panel. Can the interpreter please be unmuted? Okay. Thank you. Um, Mr. Harigi, could you please translate the following instructions and also instruct the panelists that you will be providing simultaneous translation so that they may take pauses as they speak. I would now like to welcome William Asian to testify. Uh, quisiera saludar ahora a, al, al señor William Asian que va a testificar. After William, I will be calling on Maribel Torres. Después de William Asian será el turno de Maribel Torres. Followed by Jesus Benavides. Luego será Jesus Benavides. And then Enoch Evangelista. Y después finalmente Enoch Evangelista. Thank you. Uh, William Asian, you may begin. Señor Asian, usted puede empezar. Your time will begin now. Hola, muy, muy, muy buenas, buenos días. Uh, so uh, first, hello, good morning. Um, Rina, my name, uh, uh, muy buenos días, mi nombre es Williams. Muchas gracias por tomarme en cuenta. 
Uh, voy a decir My unas palabras. William, que... I'm very thankful for, uh, for taking it into account. Voy a decir unas palabras en mi idioma que es Cachiquel. Uh, I'm going to say a few words in the, in, in the language, which is Spanish. Uh, Saker. Uh, Reunir es uh, William Cian uh, Matios. Uh, el motivo de, eh, de esta encuesta o este proyecto Bien. que tenemos. Uh, I, I don't hear. Muy buenas tardes. Eh, I'm not doctor. hearing William Asian. Muchas gracias. Eh, muy buenas tardes a todos. Good afternoon to everybody. Eh, gracias por la oportunidad que representa mi comunidad. And thank you for the opportunity to represent my community. Este saludo fue en Cachiquel, una de las 21 lenguas and mayas de Guatemala. This is this uh, salutation was in Cachiquel, one of the 21st Mayan languages. Abrem uh, Habemos muchos guatemaltecos mayas acá en Nueva York. There are a lot of people from Guatemala of Mayan descent. Que trabajamos en la ciudad de Nueva York. That work, that we work in the city of New York. Mi nombre es William Cian, soy miembro del proyecto Justicia Laboral. Uh, my name is William Cian, I'm a member of the project Justicia Social. Uno de los miles de trabajadores esenciales que nos mantuvimos repartiendo comida durante la pandemia. We are essential workers that we were given up, uh, we, uh, giving uh, food during the pandemic. Agradezco la oportunidad del consejo que nos brinda el consejo comité del comité de inmigración del consejo municipal de la ciudad de Nueva York. I give thanks to the central committee of the immigration committee of the city of New York. Para hacer posible que las voces de los deliveries sean escuchadas. In, in, in order for the voices of the people who do delivery may be heard. En el 2011 emigré a Nueva York de Guatemala en busca de mejores oportunidades de una vida digna. In 2011, I came from Guatemala. I emigrated in order to uh, find a better life for me. Cuando llegué en esta ciudad sin saber inglés, fue muy difícil encontrar trabajo. When I arrived in the city without any knowledge of English, it was very difficult for me to find a job. Mi única opción que encontré para poder sobrevivir en el trabajo es en restaurante. The only options I got to a living is to work in restaurants. Antes de la pandemia y por muchos años trabajé tiempo completo como, como repartidor de comida en Manhattan en un solo restaurante. Uh, before the pandemic, I worked full time as a delivery man for a restaurant in Manhattan. La pandemia cambió el destino de nuestras vidas. La gente trabajadora como nosotros fuimos los que sufrimos más. Uh, the pandemic changed our lives. The delivery people like myself are the ones who suffer the most. Yo perdí mi trabajo. I lost my job. Mi trabajo estable porque el restaurante donde trabajaba cerró más de un mes. My a full time job because the restaurant where I was working closed for more than a month. Sin poder ex explicar para los desempleos, sin poder aplicar para los desempleos 
excluidos de todas las ayudas que tuve que concurrir a mis ahorros para poder pagar. Uh, 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 been excluded of every kind of social uh, aid. I had to, uh, uh, to have recourse to my own savings to survive. Sobrevivir, pagar mi renta, mi comida y mis necesidades básicas con miedo a infectarme del coronavirus. To survive, to be able to pay my rent, to feed myself and be with the fear of being infected myself with COVID. Y sin opción a poder quedarme en cuarentena, tuve que salir a trabajar como repartidor de comida y entregando productos en los restaurantes. I didn't have the option during the confinement to stay home. I had to go out to work uh, as a delivery man for food and for restaurants. Muchos de nosotros vimos forzados a trabajar como repartidor de comida a domicilio. Uh, many of us were forced to work as delivery people, uh, home delivery people for food. Mediante la plata las plataformas DoorDash, Relay, Postman y otros. Uh, through uh, the sites, many sites like Dorman, Foreman, etc. Estas plataformas que ofrecen servicio al consumidor, al consumidor cambiaron nuestra realidad y condiciones laborales. These platforms that offer a service online change completely our lives. El, aprend el aprender nuestros trabajos tuvimos que re recluir a trabajar usando estas plataformas y enfrentando una nueva cruda realidad. Uh, we have to face a, a very different and, and cruel reality working through these platforms. Durante la pandemia, para poder ganar 400 dólares, muchos tuvimos que trabajar más de 50 horas. Uh, during the pandemic, in order to earn a little more than 400 dollars, many of us had to work more than 50 hours a week. Muchos abusos a pesar que nosotros mismos teníamos que comprar nuestras bicicletas. Uh, there were many abuses we suffered. For instance, many of us had to buy our own uh, bikes. Nuestro propio equipo de protección personal como cascos, chalecos, mascarillas, guantes, luces. Uh, we had to buy our own uh, protective gear like uh, 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 helmets, uh, gloves, Masks, lights. Estas aplicaciones nos roban nuestras propinas muchas veces injustamente sin poder reclamar. These sites online uh, steal from us uh, our tips uh, most of the time. Muchas veces injustamente y sin poder reclamar estas aplicaciones te bloquean. And many times, without the opportunity to ask for our tips, uh, these platforms just uh, uh, prevent us to get in. Estas aplicaciones te bloquean cada vez que un cliente te da una queja o un comentario negativo o ofensivo. Uh, these uh, uh, platforms just block you and prevent you from working every time uh, a client uh, makes a, a negative review of you. Sin poder defendernos, estas aplicaciones te quitan la oportunidad de trabajar, ya que te, ya without, que te bloquean. Yeah. Without the opportunity to defend ourselves, these platforms uh, take from us the opportunity to work without any kind of defense on our parts. Como como se Como represalia, el trabajo es cada vez más inestable. Uh, as a result, the work is more and more uh, unstable. Y con mucho más riesgo, ya que muchos tenemos que enfrentar violencia cada vez. And much riskier because many of us uh, have to face more and more violence in our work. Que intentan robar nuestras bicicletas. Nuestra herramienta de trabajo. They try to steal our bikes, which is our 
our tool with which we work. Uh, William, uh, si, le quiero decir gracias por su testimonio. Um, y si lo escribió, uh, lo, lo podemos uh, entregar, si, si, si lo puedes entregar uh, oficialmente para el comité. Uh, I'm just saying thank you to William for his testimony. And if you wrote, wrote out the rest of his testimony, we want that officially submitted to the city council. Um, y muchas gracias por tener la confianza en estar aquí con nosotros hablando de su testimonio, lo que pasó. Uh, queremos hacer algo. Y sin su testimonio, no vamos a saber qué está pasando con ustedes como trabajadores. So, muchas gracias. Muchísimas gracias, bendiciones. Y gracias por tomarnos en cuenta. Y esperemos que nuestras voces como inmigrantes sean escuchadas a través de, de este video y todos los concejales que están en este día. Bendiciones. But well, thank you very much for hearing me. And it's a good opportunity that all our voices have been heard by the committee. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank and you for your testimony. And thank you, uh, Mr. Haregi, for the translation. Next, I'd like to call on Maribel Torres and then Jesus Benavides to testify, um, who will be accompanied by um, Yesenia Mata for translation. Thank you. Your time will begin now. Sí, buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Maribel Torres. Soy miembro de la Colmena y vivo en Staten Island. El día en que la ciudad cerró, estaba trabajando como trabajadora doméstica. Durante esa semana me pidieron que limpiara profundamente ciertas casas. Mientras limpiaba con profundidad algunas de estas casas, me preocupaba mucho enfermarme, no solo por COVID-19, sino también por los químicos que estaba usando para limpiar a fondo. Son productos químicos que pueden dañar mi salud. Muchas de nosotras, mujeres inmigrantes que somos trabajadoras domésticas, estamos siendo utilizadas para hacer este tipo de trabajos y seguimos siendo excluidas e ignoradas por esta administración y el gobernador. Ahora que la ciudad se está abriendo parte a parte, ¿a quién creen ustedes que se está pidiendo que haga la limpieza profunda? A mí, a nosotras, a las trabajadoras domésticas inmigrantes. Y me preocupa mi vida como madre, como esposa, como trabajadora esencial. Pido que no me excluyan de ningún alivio económico. Pido también a que esta administración entienda la pieza fundamental que somos para esta ciudad, para que esta ciudad funcione. Gracias. My name is Maribel Torres. I am a member of La Colmena and I live in Staten Island. The day that the city shut down, I was working as a domestic worker. During that week, I was asked to deep clean certain homes. While deep cleaning some of those homes, I worried deeply about getting sick, not just because of COVID-19, but also because of the chemicals that I was using to deep clean. They are hazardous chemicals that can cause damage to my health. Many of us immigrant women who are domestic workers are being used to do this type of work and we continue being excluded and ignored by this administration and the governor. As the city has been opening up part by part, who do you think is being asked to continue doing the deep cleaning? Me, the immigrant domestic worker, and I worry about my life. As a mother, as a wife, as an essential worker, I ask not to be excluded from any economic relief. We deserve a fund that will support the efforts we have contributed to keep the city running. I also ask for this administration and this governor to understand the fundamental piece that we are so this city can continue working. Thank you. Yes, Maribel y Yesenia por su testimonio y por tener la confianza de estar aquí con nosotros y por el trabajo que hace para su familia, para sobrevivir. Muchas gracias. I would now like to call on Jesus Benavides to testify. Your time will begin now. Hola a todos. Mi nombre es Jesus Benavides. Soy parte del Comité de Jornaleros de la Colmena, trabajo y vivo en Staten Island. Antes que empezara la pandemia, muchos de los trabajadores emigrantes se encontraban en situaciones injustas. Durante esta pandemia, las cosas se empeoraron. 
los jornaleros fuimos los primeros a quienes no le pagaron. Fuimos los primeros en perder nuestro trabajo, pero también los jornaleros ayudaron para que la ciudad siga funcionando. A pesar de esos riesgos, fuimos nosotros los jornaleros quienes no nos arriesgamos día con día y sin equipo de seguridad adecuado para sacar adelante nuestra familia, nuestras familias. Hemos pedido a varios, hemos perdido a varios compañeros en los últimos meses y no solo por, la, por esta, lo que está pasando, sino porque también tienen enfermedades continuas que no pueden cuidar por falta de seguro de salud. Como trabajador esencial, pido que no me excluyan de ningún alivio económico de los jornaleros. Merecemos un fondo que, que nos apoye por todo lo que hemos contribuido para guiar a la ciudad para adelante. Gracias. My name is Jesús Benavides and I am part of the Labor Committee group in La Colmena. I work in Levenstein Island. Before the pandemic began, many of the immigrant workers were in unfair situations. During this pandemic, things got worse. The day laborers were the first who were not paid. We were the first to lose our jobs but we were also the first to help the, the city continue functioning. Despite these risks, it was us, the day laborers, who took risks day by day and without the proper safety equipment to support our families. We have lost several colleagues in recent months, and not only because of what is happening, but also because they have continuous illnesses that they cannot take care of due to the lack of health insurance. As an essential worker, I ask you do not exclude me from any economic relief, The day laborers deserve a fund. They deserve support for all the contributions that they have provided to the city. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Jesús y Eseña, uh, por su testimonio y igual por tener la confianza en estar aquí y hablar de su historia. Armani. Thank you for your testimony. Um, next, we'd like to call on Enoch, Enoch Evangelista to testify. Uh, Mr. Hadrigui, could you please uh, trans, uh, provide interpretation for Ms. Evangelista? Thank you. Your time will begin. Yeah. Eh, muy buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Enoch Evangelista Vázquez. Soy del Estado de México. Eh, Good afternoon. My name is Enoch Evangelista. Soy el Estado de México. Yo trabajaba en un restaurante. I'm from Mexico. Yo trabajaba en un restaurante. I used to work in a restaurant. Mis pagos eran formalmente semanales. I used. I, I, I was paid weekly. Desde que llegó la pandemia. Since the pandemic, solamente me pagaron la última semana, y de ahí no tuve dinero para nada. They only pay me last week, and since then I didn't have money for anything. Tuve que recorrer a centro de ayuda para sobrevivir. I had to recur to uh, in in order to survive. I had to recur to a center of aid para sobrevivir esta pandemia in order to survive the pandemic. Yo ahorita estoy trabajando en delibres. Right now I'm working as a delivery man. Y tengo miedo de, de infectarme. And I'm, uh, I'm scared of being infected. Tengo miedo y la verdad la paga es muy muy barata. Uh, I'm scared uh, to be honest with you uh, the pay the pay is very low. Trabajo los siete días. I work seven days a week. Desde que amanece hasta, hasta que oscurece. Since dawn till sunset. 
para poder comer. In order to eat. Sorry, uh, Enoch, si puede uh, pausar por, por un momento. There, there's an issue with the, with, with the, the there's a lag time uh, from the translator. Um, and I, I'm, I'm hearing it. Can, is there someone um, with Enoch? Hay alguien con usted, con usted allí en el cuarto para traducir? Okay, can we, I think we might have fixed what's happening. Uh, can we try again with the, with the translator, with Jorge? Inox, se puede seguir. Nosotros como inmigrantes también tenemos derechos. Como inmigrantes también tenemos derechos a. We as we as immigrants will also have the right the rights. Que nos traten todos por igual. That be, that be treated fairly as anyone else. Yo me han discriminado. Por ser mexicano. And discriminated for being Mexican. Y no saber inglés. And not uh, being able to speak English. Por eso pido de favor. That's why I ask as a favor que si las palabras de lo que hemos dicho pueden ayudarnos a hacer that what that what have been said today could help us hacer todos por igual to help us to be uh, equal uh, to everybody else. Les agradezco a todos. I thank you all por escucharme. Uh, for hearing me. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias a uh, Enoch y sus palabras llegaron aquí en el, al comité y les quiero dar gracias a, a todos que, que fueron parte de, uh, de, de este tiempo en frente del comité. Um, sus palabras llegaron uh, en un tiempo donde tenemos que con una respuesta justa hacer algo y, y por eso están aquí. So, muchas gracias por su tiempo. Thank you, Mr. Evangelista, for the testimony. And thank you, Mr. Haragui, for the translation. Um, I will now call on council members for questions in the order they have used the Zoom raise hand function. Council members, if you would like to ask a question and you have not yet used the Zoom raise hand function, please do so now. Seeing no hands, we'll move on to the next panel. We will now call on representatives from the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs to testify. Moya testimony will be provided by Moya Commissioner Bita Mustafi. Additionally, Director of Policy and Legislative Initiatives, Jean Bay, will be available for answering questions. As a reminder, during the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question of the administration or of a specific panelist, Please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. Before we begin, I will administer the oath. Commissioner Mustafi and Jean Bay, I will call on you each individually for a response. Please raise your right hands. 
Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Commissioner Mustafi? Yes, I do. Thank you. Dean Bay? Yes, I do. Thank you. Commissioner, you may begin when you are ready. Um, thank you so much. And first, happy citizenship and Constitution Day to everyone. Um, certainly a moment of recognition about the importance of all of our engagement and the voices of every New Yorker, as we just saw from that first panel being heard um, and acted upon. Um, I want to thank Chairman Chaka, members of the Committee on Immigration and Public Advocate Williams, uh, for inviting me to testify today. My name is Vita Mustofi. I'm the commissioner for the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. Uh, the last six months have been filled with hardship and anguish for immigrant communities. The COVID-19 crisis has pushed city government to its limits as we work with many partners to provide necessary services that New Yorkers need to survive. Despite these challenges, it's imperative for the city to continue to work, to close gaps, and specifically to focus on serving excluded and marginalized communities. In this context, I'm deeply grateful for the opportunity to focus on this important topic. I've submitted a much larger full testimony for the record, and for this hearing, I will share brief remarks about federal failures to address the needs of our communities and highlight some of the steps that we've taken as a city to help close those gaps. The coronavirus has laid bare long-standing racial disparities across our city. We know that Black and Latinx New Yorkers have disproportionately suffered the harms of the pandemic due to the effects of structural and institutional racism. We've also seen how an atmosphere of hate perpetuated by federal leadership has negatively affected Asian American communities who are facing bias motivated attacks and economic devastation. Immigrants have also been disproportionately impacted by the virus. Our own internal analysis has found the higher the makeup of immigrant or non-citizens there are per zip code, the higher the COVID-19 case and death rates are in that area. In addition, immigrant workers in the city, particularly undocumented workers, have been disproportionately affected by the economic turmoil brought on by this pandemic. We estimate that about 60% of undocumented workers have already lost their job or are at risk of losing their job due to the pandemic, compared to just 36% of all workers. Even as our immigrant communities have been racked with pain and economic struggles, the federal government has failed to address this urgent need. Undocumented immigrants and mixed status families were excluded from the direct stimulus payments provided. The unemployment insurance programs, including federal subsidies, are limited to those who are work authorized. Moreover, because of legal restrictions on the public benefits and programs that immigrants can access, Immigrants have been unable to access many services on the state and local level that would have provided support during this unprecedented crisis. If that were not enough, the Trump administration has chosen this moment to push calamitous lies about immigrants and expand an anti-immigrant agenda. ICE has refused to halt immigration enforcement activities contributing to the spread of COVID-19 within detention centers and globally. The Trump administration has also re relentlessly attacked working class immigrants through a variety of policy changes over the past few months. The most obvious example of this are the public charge rule changes, which have led to deep confusion and reluctance to seek services among our communities. The Trump administration has pushed out a host of additional policy changes during this crisis, including fee changes, restrictions on asylum eligibility, and more. Recognizing the failure of the federal government to meet the needs of New Yorkers and its relentless attacks on community, we have worked to close the gap and provide much needed services to help alleviate the harms during this pandemic in myriad ways. In June, my office worked with the Department of Health to launch an ad campaign called Seek Care Without Fear that emphasized that it is safe to seek COVID-19 testing and care emergency Medicaid, food assistance, tenant protection, and legal help regardless of immigration status or ability to pay. 
Campaign messaging was included in all of our outreach and digital engagement and translated into 25 languages. Moya also led the city's thinking on how to incorporate language access into every part of COVID response. Language and other barriers make it particularly difficult for immigrant communities to access the information that they need. From the beginning of the pandemic, our focus was with to communicate necessary information to all New Yorkers so that they could access city services. We activated the language access task force to assess the challenges of the crisis. We provided guidance and technical assistance to members of the task force on best practices and hosted two convenings with agencies language access coordinators to address specific agency challenges. In addition, our team delivered an almost six-fold increase in translations compared to last year. Moya remained open and continues to provide services with modifications in operations to ensure staff and clients both remain safe during the pandemic. While IDNYC enrollment sites have been temporarily closed, online renewals continue to be processed, and we are in the process of phasing in a reopening plan for physical sites. Our community services team remains more active than ever, fielding constituent concerns and calls. Our call volume has drastically increased um, from just 209 calls in the first three months of the year to nearly 4,000 calls between April and August. Our legal services providers have adjusted their focus with supplemental funding to address additional complications due to the COVID-19 world. Specifically, we were able to allocate funds to the Rapid Response Legal Collaborative to assist and represent immigrants detained during the pandemic. Similarly, in light of the particularly severe effects of COVID-19 on low-income immigrants, we provided approximately $200,000 to cover application fees for those who were unable to pay their filing fees at this moment. In addition, we provided funding to cover DACA renewal fees for approximately 300 DACA applications. The city also partnered with the Open Society Foundation to create the COVID-19 Immigrant Emergency Relief Program. With a $20 million grant, it allowed us to provide direct payments of between $400 and $1,000 for individuals and their families in partnership with community-based providers across our city. This funding has provided a critical infusion of funds for families, but addresses only a fraction of the need in our city. In addition, we've used interest in this program to connect immigrant families to other resources and programs that are available to them. We also supported the Mayor's Fund and Human Resources Administration to secure private funding to help New Yorkers, regardless of status, receive assistance to pay their funeral expenses for loved ones. The COVID-19 Burial Assistance Program helped address the exclusion of immigrant families from the state and city's existing program. Some IDNYC staff have been reassigned to this program to help with intake, given our extensive experience working with immigrant families. Health access is more important than ever during a global pandemic, and we've worked consistently with our partners at New York City Health and Hospitals on a variety of health access initiatives, including the Test and Taste Trace Program and the expansion of, F of NYC Care in advance of that program. Finally, we work closely with a variety of city partners to reach immigrant New Yorkers about COVID-19 specific guidance and programming that the city or other government actors had created in response to the pandemic. As I end, I want to take a moment to recognize the crucial backbreaking work that community-based organizations have taken on during this time on their own and in many ways in partnerships with the city. Without their help, much of the work that we have done to serve the immigrant communities left out of federal relief would not have been possible. They too have been pushed to the breaking point in the wake of this emergency. It is the fundamental responsibility of government to ensure that our community's needs are met. And for this reason, Moya will continue to work with our community providers, stakeholders, and partners to help address the real needs uh, expressed certainly by your first panel, but that we have heard repeatedly from communities that we work with. Thank you again for calling this hearing and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Commissioner, for your testimony. I will now turn it over to questions from Chairman Chaka. Commissioner, please stay unmuted if possible during the question and answer period. Thank you. Chairman Chaka, please begin. 
Uh, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. It's been a while since we've been uh, together like this. And so I just want to say thank you. And I hope you are healthy, you and your family. Um, thank you. Likewise. Uh, recharged. There's a lot, a lot of work ahead of us. And, and so I, I welcome our partnership uh, in full, full steam. And I just want to acknowledge to the first panel and their words were incredibly impactful. I think you and I both have heard these stories on the ground. It's really important for people to listen to that uh, in their native language. I know that the language access, and even as we struggle through the language access and translation, uh, it becomes a thing that we all can try to make better in this world. And the, the most important thing is that their voices are, are heard. And so thank you for your patience and compassion uh, as, we, as we move through this. My, my first question really is uh, to the incredible work that you've done and you've kind of seen the city activate, what were the actual programs and services that Moya suspended during March and April uh, and, and really throughout the, the pandemic? Can you kind of walk us through the things that, that were shut down? You talked about IDNYC and some other things, but uh, give us a sense about what actually stopped. Sure. Um, I, I'm happy to say not, nothing fully stopped. <laughs> um, everything uh, had a pivot or transition. Um, and the thing that was really like fully halted was our ability to do in-person IDNYC enrollments um, for many obvious reasons. But for those less aware, you know, we, as you know, designed this program to be co-located at locations where we know immigrant dense communities are using services or benefits and when all of our host sites closed, we were left with no option but to also close um, and have been spending a lot of time to assess both the safety needs of our staff, but also the host sites and the public um, as we reopen and hope to have more to share there. We did pivot a whole team to focus on renewals by phone um, which is really amazing. So contacting, I, I think at this point, it's over 25,000 New Yorkers to remind them of their ability to renew, helping people through that process um, and a myriad other ways in which we continue renewal online. Um, and so the additional programming, so I'll, I'll start with legal initiatives. So um, our Action NYC program in particular, um, it, all of the sort of initial screenings pivoted to uh, telephone or telephonic um, initial screening. So all of our providers adjusted swiftly uh, to move their sort of intake or screening process telephonically. Um, they have continued in this manner since the start of the stay at home order, um, but uh, kind of come to the office as needed for paperwork and things like that. So. Those services remain. Um, we saw an initial dip in uh, utilization of our hotline for obvious reasons, I think in um, March um, and, and maybe a little bit of April, but then it spiked again. We actually made a concerted effort to get the word out um, that the hotline was still active and available, that people could still reach out and we saw, saw those numbers go back up and certainly spike recently um, when kind of big decisions have come down like DACA and uh, public charge decisions. Can we hone in just on the outline? I'm really interested in the, that spike of uh, re-engagement and what yeah. questions were you fielding from that hotline? Sure, so our Action NYC hotline, um, which uh, is run by Catholic Charities, our partner on the ground, um, uh, we worked with them to just, you know, ensure that it was operable and had moved safely uh, to continue operations. Um, and that was true pretty immediately. So there wasn't a gap in service there. Um, but I think like with all New Yorkers, and we've talked extensively with them about this and with our legal services providers, those initial months, you know, people weren't reaching out for a first time immigration consultation, for example, right? Um, it was really about people's survival and safety. Um, and so I don't think any of us were shocked that we saw some lower uh, than average numbers, but we did want to ensure that the fact that we remained open was something that New Yorkers were aware of 
So my team actually worked on a concerted campaign to get that information out. And we saw those numbers go back up. Um, and then we saw spikes as key decisions came down and we were again sort of pushing out the availability of the hotline for information. I would say still kind of DACA public charge and sort of the, the perennial um, uh, questions that we've been seeing the most of remain the same. And and uh, I just want to get us what you're talking about, like this survival. Uh, were people calling about food, uh, those kind of uh, non-legal, non uh, non DACA specific issues? So I just want to separate two things. So the it, the Action NYC Legal Helpline, which is really uh, designed and intended to be uh, uh, migration counselors that can assist folks with specifically immigration legal questions or connect folks to appointments with our legal service provider network versus our constituent services line, which you heard me testify, saw just a dramatic spike, right? Yeah. Um, and again, part of that was a response and an effort on our part, recognizing um, challenges either due to language access, due to comp like just competency and immigrant specific needs. We pushed out with much greater intentionality our direct line for folks instead of recommending necessarily always having to go through 311 or to connect with a particular other agency. Our team could assist folks as sort of uh, assistance in case managing them to different needs. We saw a huge number of requests come through there related to what you're identifying. So food as being sort of near the top, emergency relief near the top, health access and testing uh, near the top amongst others. Got it. Is there something that you can give us in terms of, uh, of the, the kind of clarity in the requests? Uh, I'm thankful that you kind of separated both uh, what we'll call the Action NYC hotline and then the constituent case cases. Is there, is there some reporting that you can give us in terms of what, what's coming in, uh, really identifying what that spike was percentage wise? I don't know if you have any of that data in front of you, but we can move on to the questions if that's something you can get to us later. Yeah, sure. Um, I think I, I hit it, but I'm happy to um, sort of identify more and, and, and get back to you with greater well, specifics on numbers. Yeah, I, I mean, are we, are we talking about three times? I, I think what we really want to understand is is what what you all got in terms of the asks and what those asks were. Yeah. And and, and are we talk? I mean, I, I haven't heard a number yet about how many calls, and if you have that, that'd be great. Yeah. So, so I testified to the number of calls, so nearly four thousand um, between April and August, with additional callers that we received voicemails from and returned. So just a huge um, increase in volume that came through our hotline. Again, the number one request around emergency relief, um, secondarily around food, and, and thirdly around health access. But we can get you, uh, you know, a more clear breakdown. Awesome. Thank you. I appreciate that. Let's move over to the census, uh, the self-response rate and the non-response uh, follow-up period. Um, and to this day, I think we're all looking at at, at a really devastating number uh, and rate in general. How has Moya participated in activities to ensure the complete count? And can you talk us a little bit about what you might be doing in the next few days? Um, yeah. So this has been a priority of our office and our work, including during this pandemic, um, to ensure that we're, we're working in partnership with the census team, um, as well as all of our community stakeholders on getting the word out. So I can speak a little bit to what we've been doing. Um, our team produced 16 of our own videos in different languages um, to encourage folks to um, participate in the census and to give key messaging and information. Um, these were disseminated in different sort of more intentional ways through uh, sort of things like WhatsApp um, or Kakao Chat, right? Being really intentional about how we were disseminating this information at this moment in a way that was safe, but also uh, received by the intended audiences. Um, we've also, also conducted regular sort of virtual census days of action 
Um, the team has done, I think at this point, over 100 plus town halls. Census is always included in those engagements as a key um, effort or priority. Um, we regularly part participate in sort of days of action. So getting out there, right? Um, particularly at this moment, um, whether it's at food pantries or at subway stations at um, testing, sort of outside testing locations, the team has been uh, engaged in those activities and coordinated with the census team. Um, we've been doing weekly phone banks. If you wanna participate in one, let us know um, where the team comes together. Um, as Moya, as community partners with community members, um, and we reach roughly about 2,500 folks a week um, through that effort. They've also been doing texting efforts, um, so using different kind of platforms like Hustle to, to kind of get the word out um, and support the efforts of the census team. Those are some of the ways that we've um, done 2020 census engagement. I've joined some press conferences and other efforts as well, and we certainly continue and plan to continue all of those efforts um, and sort of amplifying those of others until September 30th, including today with a citizenship video and op-ed that encourages people to do the census. Awesome, thank you. And clearly there's there's a gap here uh, in reaching our, our community. And I think the target for immigrant communities is is going to be really fierce and needed for us and um and we just haven't we haven't gotten the numbers that i think we all expected we put so many resources and and strategy around this and we have still yet to to really pull it in um council member moya and i represent some of the lowest rates right now and it's it's just difficult so i i just hope and and, and i think a lot of the stuff you just spoke to in the census was stuff that we've, we've already deployed and yet we have not seen the response. And so um, I just hope we have more strategy as we move closer to the end, because uh, everything that we feared is, is, is on its way. And this is not even talking about the election. This is just talking about the census in the past 10 years. And so um, I, I would love to spend some time with you on the phone and talk through some of that and how we can really uh, focus on that together. That sounds great. And if there are efforts in Sunset Park or other areas where we can be helpful, please um, let us know. I think we're all ears and certainly creative and innovative ideas are all welcome at this time. Oh, and we need innovation and, and something new because everything we're, we're, we're putting out there is just, it's not working. It's, it's not working and, or what it did was what it did and we need something new. So uh, the only thing I'll say to that is it is working a little bit, right? I think people are doing really incredible things, particularly the providers that the city and the council and administration together supported, right? Um, they're doing innovative videos, they're doing door to door, they're doing one on one. And I think all of that is really tremendous. And we have seen the uptick um, in, in undercounted areas. And I really you know, testament to the census team itself, think that that has a lot to do with a, just a dramatic shift in how they were doing their outreach engagement. Yes, all true. And we're just, <laughs> not there yet. we're not, we're not there yet. Let, let's go into language access, because uh, I think that's going to be an important thing as we think about COVID. Yeah. Um, there have been plenty of rumors and misinformation about COVID-19 itself circulating on social media and mobile apps, manipulating public opinion and creating false narratives for folks. And, and these are pretty dangerous, I think, in, in everything that, that's kind of coming through the officials uh, in healthcare. Um, how is Moya working right now to combat that directly? Um, so I'll say a couple of things. In terms of language access, um, you know, this is a, uh, an area, an issue that I know we, we both deeply care about um, and have ha paid a lot of attention to um, predating this moment, um, but certainly uh, more so, even more so at this moment. I think to answer your question, a part of how to address that was how do we get information out more swiftly and with greater quality, right? Um, that is something that we have focused on in general as a priority in the language access work is how to increase the quality of the translations and the work that's put out. And as I noted in my testimony, an initial part of the work of the task force was to identify how to better support agencies in ensuring that these critical messages, which were coming down, you know, just 
rapidly um, were ones that were effectively disseminated and shared in, in many languages. One of the initial things that we did as a task force was actually recommended that uh, the Department of Health move away from translation in 10 languages and expand it to 25. Um, and that happened, rapid, happened rapidly. We also encouraged uh, and worked alongside them in thinking about, again, thinking about innovation and being creative about how information is being shared or recognition that literacy is also a challenge, right? Not just English proficiency. And so creation of uh, videos um, and voiceovers and digital like voice messaging as additional sort of tactics that could be used in disseminating information. They've done an incredible job with that. We worked with health and hospitals on creating a video around the hoteling program because we heard so many questions about it and what it looked like and what it meant. Um, and we further looked at um, leveraging sort of uh, the tools that our team has developed, including uh, sort of tools around consistency with translation. So us kind of keeping a, a more quality assurance barometer on keywords and messaging around COVID so that there was consistency sort of across utilization um, and uh, leveraging uh, contracts to do, you know, meet sort of 24 to 48 hour uh, translations for key messages in, in short sort of languages that we disseminated through our networks, through digital media, through all the different platforms and, and ways in which we were getting information out. Um, and then lastly, I would say we worked really closely to ensure that our sort of infrastructure that we developed was of, of um, sort of most use um, or easy use for limited and least proficient New Yorkers. So we developed a COVID immigrant resource guide that we housed on our website that we continue both to update the guide itself, but also a frequently asked questions based on what we're hearing from communities as to questions around particular services or needs. And what we did was something we had been working on, but hadn't sort of turned the green light on until the pandemic was We'd been working on a, a sort of piloting a, a, a website interpretation tool that does human translation. So sort of higher quality than Google Translate um, in at least the top 10 languages. We turned that on in March, um, at the end of March. Um, and so our website and the guide itself is human translated in the city's top 10. And then we permanently translated into 25 languages. And that we saw a huge spikes on our website in different languages. Now, did you CBOs uh, and kind of help Brown with communities, uh, different immigrant communities? And then the other the other piece to that is how how did you um, uh, understand the effective nature of the of the pieces? I, I get that a lot of folks were were kind of engaging you on the download side, but were you able to get feedback and how were you able to measure that efficiency of, of the of the message? I missed the first part of what you said. It cut out a little bit. Were you working with CBOs to help? Uh, you, you talked a lot about the city agencies that you're connecting with. Were any CBOs tapped to help de uh, develop the messaging? Um, we worked really closely with community-based providers. I would say my team, <laughs> On a daily basis, almost on a daily basis, elevated key issues or feedback that they were receiving from their engagements, both with providers as well as community members, and that informed or adjusted uh, sort of what we were doing. I didn't actually, I think, fully touch on your question around fraud prevention. So I mostly talked about like how were we getting information out as like education as like the primary utilization and we pivoted many of our programs to support that so our know your rights programming our nyc care outreach programming our we speak programming all of this we sort of pivoted to and trained everybody working on those on all of this and also shared what we were producing in different languages and i know many community-based providers sort of took that and adapted it to be to better serve or to ensure it was serving most effectively the folks that they were working with. Um, I, and additionally, we worked with our sister agencies at DCWP 
um, to get information out around consumer protection. We did a lot of outreach engagement um, and work with them. We also worked with the DA's offices. So the Staten Island DA um, Immigrant Task Force sort of reached out to us to think about how can we uh, support them in sort of anti-fraud messaging. Our team actually developed videos for them in different languages for them to also be able to utilize. So lots of sort of different um, uh, ways to address, I think, the question that you're raising. Yeah, and thank you for that. And, and I think part of part of that is really building um, one, acknowledging the work, no doubt, the crisis moment caught us all off guard in a lot of ways and repivoting toward the messages that were coming down. We all lived that. Uh, I'm now thinking about next wave. And, and I'm not saying there's going to be one. What I'm saying is, how do we prepare? And so are any of these structures, infrastructure, uh, relationships in evergreen form? Like, are they going to still, still be there? Are they there forever now? Are they embedded into how Moya does what they do? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, thank you for the question. It's a good one. So yeah, I, I think I testified to this effect um, when you had me the first time around, but I really do think that uh, particularly on this front, it has strengthened a lot of sort of how we do this work um, and what we need in place to, mo to most effectively do it. And so um, we have been working a, a couple of things. One is to ensure that sort of the um, emergency translation contract is there and fully loaded as needed um, to assist if an emergency were to come down. So that is one key effort that we are ensuring can, remains in place um, and is something that we could leverage as needed. Um, another is we developed um, and have been working with agencies around additional guidance around website accessibility and are working closely with Do It to this effect. Um, and um, we have not returned to the task force, but certainly the task force is a key sort of utilization that we would go back to again, but it did serve the function that I think we needed it to around some of the best practices and other um, sort of guidance we were able to disseminate to agencies around specific translation needs. Um, additionally, we identified during this period two translation service providers that ended up providing free services, pro bono services, to our sister agencies. Um, so sort of building out those relationships and in, ensuring that as we need to, um, we can, can uh, you know, utilize or rely on them. We also built out like a little, we have a bank, but not in this way, a bank of city employees who were able to sort of do their normal course of business, who spoke different languages and could support with rapid translation um, that we haven't had to leverage at this moment, but certainly something we can return to um, as we need to. So those are some of the things, um, but certainly a lot more to both think through and also ensure to your point is, um, you know, putting us in a better place if, if there was to be a second wave or any additional crisis. Awesome, thank you. For that. And, and, and again, thanks for, for really kind of offering the, um, the future work to, to kind of codify this and institutionalize this. I, just to, to put a finer point on the, the, the emergency task force on language access, uh, can we institutionalize that? Is that something that you can do and, and, and really kind of make that official and, and, and promote that? It is official. It's institutionalized at the Office of Emergency Management. Our team is always brought in. It, Rick, you know, it's a couple of criteria get triggered, right? The scale of the impact in a particular area, um, the population that's impacted, and then we're we're brought in to to provide guidance. Um, but what we are continuing to do is meet sort of as a trifecta of agencies: OEM, our team, and DOH. Um, uh, even though others are no longer joining it. Got it. Thank you for that. Uh, and I, I'll just give a quick anecdote, and then we'll uh, anecdote, and then we can talk a little bit about some of the other agency collaborations. When Sunset Park spike went up uh, in terms of positive rates, I went out to the city response that brought in testing, and I took a test, and I just I just saw a lot of. Um, opportunities for more support for translation 
uh, there's a lot of triage stuff, but we'll talk about language access. A lot of the, the, the folks that were there helping were using Google Translate on their phones to, uh, to speak with people. And it just felt like an opportunity there to, to really understand that. We, we gave it to your team and I think there's been some changes, but I just wanted to kind of offer that as, as even as, as recent as when, when that happened at Sunset Park, uh, we were able, we were still witnessing these gaps. Yeah. So I'm hoping that we can, we can now really hone in on some of the stuff that's happening at DOH and, and that relationship. And, and I know this is hard. And so there's a lot of compassion in these questions that I'm asking, but also um, a sense of how we can track that, that those changes as we, as we move forward, because we are moving on 13 different cylinders at the same time. Um, so um I don't know if you want to respond to that, but it's just more. It's yeah, more no, just to thank you for raising it. And certainly we worked with the health and hospitals and the test and tracing team initially, actually in the design of the program, both in looking at linguistic and cultural competency needs and to ensure that as sites were set up, that was baked in. So not so happy to hear that that's not the experience, but um, when stuff gets elevated, it's helpful. It helps us address it. And that census sunset park, um, sort of a recent peak, there were a couple other things that were addressed to us that we worked really closely with the test and trace program to ameliorate and receive positive feedback that it, it got better. So, you know, um, I think to your point, no, no, you know, no, no criticism, want to hear it, want to hear the challenges so that we can be responsive. Awesome. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, so how, how has outreach and messaging from NYC CARE shifted since the beginning of the pandemic? Uh, and how are they continuing to enroll uh, folks as you kind of move to telephonic and, and internet-based uh, communication? Yeah, so um, as you can imagine and know, um, so in the first uh, few months, really the goal around from health and hospitals was to ensure that sort of everybody was being directed centrally um, to receive support. And that doesn't mean that people weren't then being um, encouraged to enroll in NYC care if that was an identified need. It just meant that the triaging had to happen in a different way to ensure at the, at the sort of peak of hospital um, uh, infrastructure being weighed down that it was being managed in the most efficient way to, to support. So what we did was worked with the providers on the ground that we we found this is the key piece of how we support the NYC care program um, in uh, messaging and ensuring that they had information about other resources and helping as they pivoted from in-person engagements to virtual or other engagements. Many actually, I know, you know, it, it was sometimes it was just one-on-one, one -on -one, right? They would wait till a child went to bed and sit down on the phone with individuals to talk through resources available or how they could access testing or health support. Um, and so that uh, has continued with the sort of notable exception, of course, that we advanced the rollout of NYC care in Queens and Manhattan um, very happily by four months. Um, we launched uh, just a couple weeks ago at the beginning of September, um, the full citywide effort. Um, and we not only continued, you know, recognition of sort of the importance of the on the ground work, we not only sort of did a new uh, sort of round of funding for community providers in Queens and Manhattan, but have extended um, the sort of contracts that we have had with providers in the Bronx uh, Brooklyn and Staten Island to continue this work and that you know those uh, now it's about 30 organizations um, that speak different languages that are working in different communities and different capacities have you know in this period of time I know reached about 15,000 folks um, and our goal is through this effort to ensure that um, the NYC care program now being available citywide is really the front door for folks who uh, are uninsured. You know, we know it's about half of our undocumented population is uninsured. Um, and we wanna make sure people know that this is available to them and that they can enroll. I think if nothing else, a health pandemic 
speaks to why this is such a critical uh, program, right? It's about having a primary care home. It's about having a safe space with your doctor that you know and that you trust and who knows you, right? Who could tell you, yes, you have a critical condition. You should not be doing these things or you need to go get tested and this is how you can do it. And having that 24 hour number that you can call and ensuring that you have excuse me, that pharmaceutical access, right? It's underscores that much more what we what we inherently know, but has been a part of the heart and soul of what this program is. Yeah, awesome. And this is great. You know, you said 15,000, is that engagement or is that enrollment, 15,000 enrollment? Um, engagement. Engagement. Do you have a sense of numbers on the actual enrollment? The full, the full kind of gone through everything and are now enrolled. They're gonna kill me if I give you the wrong number. Um, <laughs> I, I uh, I'm gonna hold and just confirm that the number I think yeah, is the right number. <laughs> small businesses, because this is something that you know we just passed a law yesterday on the 10% uh, surcharge for businesses. Uh, many of our businesses are immigrant businesses. Tell me a little bit about your work with SBS, specifically on how getting your out. Know, uh, about safety, reopening guidelines, those key things keep changing. They'll continue to change for a while. Uh, PPE, tell us a little bit about that work specifically. Yeah, so um, we worked really closely with SBS um, on a number of things. So um, we focused efforts initially with them on getting information out around the payroll protection program um, and ensuring that people uh, small businesses had uh, the information on how to apply and that it was broken down in language for folks um, who weren't English proficient um, and did a number of engagements and webinars in different languages um, with SBS and really our team worked to support them in a lot of those efforts to ensure we were more effectively reaching folks. Um, we also worked uh, to do and have continued to do um, PPE distribution. So um, we actually, it, this is a, a broader citywide effort, but um, I think we worked with some small businesses, with uh, community-based organizations and others to identify uh, PPE needs. And then would, we worked to distribute those and continue to do so. Um, so that's been a part of what we do as well as obviously SBS being focused on the constituents that they have been working with to this effect. Um, we've elevated issues and concerns that we have heard um, from small businesses to them to help address um, and continue to look uh, with them about additional needs for communities doing business walks and others to understand kind of people's experiences. I know this is such a difficult time. Um, and there's a lot of uncertainty um, and uh, the economic experience is so great, but um, they have been a, a, a really good partner and, and one in which we've ended up working a lot closely with at this time. Thank you. Uh, moving over to the, uh, the, con the, the concept of fraud at, in, in general, and there's some, I, th I think we're seeing a lot more opportunities for fraud uh, and scam targeting immigrants. Uh, tell us a little bit about what you're working on that uh, with DC, uh, DCWP or NYPD specifically, or the DA's offices, anything new uh, and targeted on that front? Um, I mean, I, I, I think I spoke uh, to this um, a little bit when you asked me the prior question. Um, and uh, I don't, I don't know that I have too much to add. So we haven't seen too much that's new to my understanding. I think we have um, obviously seen a lot of con uh, sort of consumer needs, right, with um, uh, DCWP sort of stepping in to enforce. Um, we've seen a lot of uh, employers not abiding by uh, the rights of their workers, right, in, in either enforcing paid sick leave or um, uh, uh, pay, pay for work. Um, and so we've worked closely with DCWP to both understand, monitor, and get information out about these things. Um, we have worked with uh, DCWP and the DAs to give sort of specific examples um, of fraud that uh, we have heard of that have um, been elevated to us and our team. 
um, and ensured that we've incorporated in our fact sheets, uh, sort of our frequently asked questions, um, uh, a Q and A for individuals. And I don't know, uh, Jean, if you want to add anything. This is really something that you've also helped to lead. Thank you. Just um, one thing to add is that um, one of the things that um, you know we have discussed a lot with the DA's office as well as DCWP is that people buy into fraud because they really need resources and you know they don't know where to get them. And so one of the things that we really try to do is a lot of proactive um, outreach. Um, so whether it's DA's office with their um, immigrant CBO partners that they have or with the BCWP. So just making sure that we had a lot of, um, that's why a lot of the videos that we created were actually focused on city resources that are actually you know available to everyone to make sure that everyone knew that there are you know, legitimate resources and where they can get information and services that they need. So that was some of the work that we have done relating to virtual town halls and um, video you know, uh, distribution to the people. Got it, thank you. And, and I know we had already talked about it. I guess I was just looking, um, and there might not be anything specifically so we can move on, but really looking at, at things like trends, uh, any issues that are in progress right now, investigation, not to talk about the investigation, but that NYPD is working and activating teams inside of their, or the DA's offices and their immigration offices. So if there's nothing in specific, then that's fine. But that's what I was trying to see if we can uh, understand. We engaged early and often with, um, certainly the DA's offices as we do sort of regularly as well as our providers and others. And I don't think beyond the sort of number one things that we were hearing, which really had to do with enforcement of things like paid sick leave and people's um, sort of wage and hour rights and things like that we saw, um, you know, and then generally like price increases or gouging that DCWP was enforcing in businesses. I don't think that we saw trends um, to speak to, um, or sort of, you know, focus on, we did focus, as I know, you know, um, and spoke to in your opening remarks on just the rise in hate crimes against, um, yeah. particularly our Asian American communities, um, across the city. And we worked really closely for several months with both NYPD and the mayor's, um, office to prevent hate crimes, uh, as well as our, uh, human rights commission. As a, as a sort of cohort of agencies that met regularly and developed sort of responses to what we were seeing and different ways of addressing them. Everything from our own communications and information dissemination and town halls to education and curricula and programming to being responsive to complaints that people were receiving and investigations and sort of tracking them more closely. So that was one area where certainly we were working closely with NYPD on being responsive. Okay. And, and I'll just leave you with this, no need for response, we're, we'd love your support. Uh, we know that there are workers that are getting furloughed and, and uh, pushed out because of the economy, but done so potentially illegally. And many of these are immigrant workers. Uh, and and so some of that just came out in a hearing with Industry City, some workers mm -hmm. at Industry City. I'd love to kind of uh, brief you on that and seeing any support that you can offer us as we move to protect their rights uh, and bring in all the offices to ensure a proper investigation happens. Yeah, please. Thank you. And just to circle back, I was right. I should have just said it. Thirty thousand in release in NYC care so far. Okay. Right on. There, that's. that's Beautiful number. Yeah. Uh, you're trying to get to 40 uh, ASAP, right? Is that the. ASAP. <laughs> uh, let's talk a little bit about food services. A lot of stuff kind of both at the mutual aid side with neighbors helping neighbors, um, but also from the city. What role did Moya play in getting food out to people uh, and creating the meal hubs and really impacting immigrant communities that can access that? 
Yeah, thank you. This has been, as I said, um, in terms of the sort of demand around questions or need that we've seen, food has hovered in sort of one to three, uh, depending on the individual um, that we're speaking to or the community. So huge, huge, huge need um, and uh, just a tremendous area of uh, work um, that happened and continues to happen. Um, so, you know, we worked closely and the mayor has said this continuously to ensure that in anything that the city was lifting up as it related to food distribution, it was available to all regardless of immigration status um, and that there weren't sort of unnecessary barriers to people being able to access it because of fear of questions or that might be asked or information that might be collected. So we worked really, really closely with many, many different actors across the administration on some of these pieces. Um, and sort of centered, of course, sort of three primary efforts, one around increasing um, in, in partnership with the council, funding to food pantries across the city, two around establishing the meal hubs with about 400 locations across the city, and lastly, um, uh, lifting up a food delivery service beyond the elderly, um, but really for anybody that felt they needed it at the, at the moment, either for fear of contraction or inability to leave your home or many, many other reasons, right? Um, and in, in all levels of that uh, sort of engagement and programming, we've been involved in, in different ways. So I spoke sort of onset sort of policy setting around how, why, what we were doing to be inclusive. Um, but beyond that, also looking at um, how to ensure that the information was being disseminated um, in, you know, as much of a linguistic and cultural competent way as possible. We worked to ensure that at our meal hub locations, our immigrant resource guides were available for people to pick up in different languages, um, attuned to the needs of that community. Um, we worked to ensure that as the uh, Get Food program was um, being rolled out, that a trusted enroller program was established, recognizing that the feedback we received and certainly know from our work is that, you know, while an immigrant New Yorker might feel comfortable walking to a community-based provider that they work with, they might not so much feel comfortable going online and registering for that program. So the trusted enrollers, we established at least a network of 10 directly from us and additional others that could enroll people directly. And then our team became trusted enrollers. So our outreach um, team and others to be able to enroll individuals as well themselves. Mm -hmm. um, so those are some of the ways in which we've worked on um, the food efforts, we also, through our emergency relief programming, required that information about um, the food delivery uh, services and meal hubs be given to every New Yorker that inquired about the emergency relief effort. Um, and, you know, we received a lot of feedback around sort of how to make the, the program even more tuned to the needs of communities and have been working closely with the food policy team and the team over at sanitation in looking at sort of the next phase of this. Well, let's talk about that. I think this is an opportunity to uh, elevate something that came to my office a lot with some of the stuff that we were working on at the mutual aid work and which was pretty robust in the sense of park, but across the city. Um, when dealing with immigrant communities with culturally specific food. Did yeah. that come up and how did how did Moya really help to change those things? Do you feel like the city is is there in terms of giving immigrant communities culturally specific food? Yeah, it's one of the number one things that came up to us. Um, and it's something that we've been working with. You know, I, I can't speak directly for all of the decision making from my colleagues, but certainly empathize with the sort of scale and um, intentionality of an emergency response at the moment as to as opposed to sort of what's what's um, you know what's ideal uh, for for communities and we're really at the place with stepping away from sort of the emergency moment to step back and say how do how can we adjust this to be more responsive to things like cultural competence um, and what we've been hearing from communities. And I think 
we have a shared interest across the administration, I'm happy to say. Um, we've been in regular conversations on this front, so any additional thoughts that people are hearing or feedback, we'd love to hear them. Awesome, and, and maybe that'll come up in the panels moving forward. So I, I hope people who are here to testify soon um, can bring that up if that wasn't already on your testimony. Um, let's talk about, so, and as we transition to HRA, HRA has many benefits and a lot of those benefits, people because of public charge, and you saw that happening before COVID have opted out. Uh, but before we get to the HRA piece, I just wanna say that I think as we look at, uh, I use the word evergreen, but institutionalizing this work, COVID may disappear, but the food needs. Yeah. And I think that's what we're, we're really understanding. And so okay. I just looking at commitment from you and uh, and I know there's a lot more commitment that needs to happen across the board, but that that food will continue to arrive, uh, that we get better at, at distribution, language access, all those pieces, culturally competent food, but that you also understand that food need will not go down even if COVID uh, is solved. For sure. I think that um, this is a, you know, I, I don't, I'm not the first to say it. I think the mayor has actually said this, right? This is a commitment is to ensure that we're being responsive on food that no New Yorker feels they have to go hungry. And I think really the focus at this moment is the, the pivoting to be responsive to feedback we've received and to think about what the next phase looks like to, to better serve our communities. And, um, you know, I'm again, happy to say that these conversations have already begun, have been taking place for a while and we look forward to continuing them. Awesome. And I'll follow up with your team about a church in Sunset Park that uh, is seeing up to 800 cases and uh, they don't have the capacity for food right now mm. with private donations. And so that's just an example of, of food need going up, uh, even when COVID rates are down. Yeah. So let's just go back to HRA and give us a little sense about that. Public charge has made a big impact. COVID probably to uh, elections a note about what HRA is doing in partnership with you? Sure. So um, at, HRA does a lot, so I certainly won't pretend to speak to all of it, but um, we focused, as I said, early on, early and often, both around public charge and, and messaging um, on that front. And as I said, actually with the Department of Health, we launched the Support Not Fear campaign that was informed certainly by the experiences of other, other agencies like HRA and community members that we were speaking to. We also conducted a focus group, honestly, in the midst of the crisis, just to ensure we got it right. Um, and we were reaching people in, in the right way. So we had a, a huge focus on TV and radio because we, that was really as how people were receiving a lot of their information. Um, additionally, we uh, worked on the burial assistance program with HRA, right, not just um, addressing the inclusion or lack of inclusion of immigrant New Yorkers who were undocumented, but also um, being responsive to the fact that in an economic um, devastation, the reimbursement was, was pretty low. Um, so raising the whole cost for all New Yorkers um, of the reimbursement um, and also making that retroactive. So it was available to, to New Yorkers um, back to March. Um, that was a huge effort and one that we continued to work with them on um, and we have been, uh, they were a part of initially the language access task force. Um, so brought in as one of the agencies that was really, you know, giving critical services, making sure that those services were um, available in many different languages and in, in, the, in the myriad ways um, for in, in limited English proficient New Yorkers. Those are some of the ways we worked closely with them. Um, also around, sorry, one other thing I didn't mention was the shifting of legal services, right? Just staying in close coordination around the, the sort of broader spe spectrum of programming that the city has funded um, to ensure that we were being responsive to providers um, and supporting sort of as needed. And on CME, part of the emergency task force language access as well, or just HRA? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? You cut out. The OCME component, were they part of the emergency task force for language access or yeah. was it just, sorry, so they, they were a part of it as well. Yes. Um, 
Awesome. And, and, and I remember our teams talking a lot during that time and, and really spending time just to understand it. Uh, so thank you for, for that work. Sure. There was, there's one other thing I didn't mention, um, which is around um, uh, tenant protections. So we've, we've worked closely with HRA on this front as well, both in terms of legal supports, but also which, you know, thankfully, at least until October 1st, we're not seeing evictions related to COVID uh, economic loss, um, hopefully uh, even further than that. Um, but uh, additionally, um, we've been working with the, their home base, pro, uh, with them on their home base program um, to ensure that that program is situated and able to assist New Yorkers um, as needed at this moment. Rent, rents and um, sort of housing in general, as I said, again, and that tri trifecta of the top three things that we've been hearing about and concerns. And so that's an area where we've been working with HRA as well. Well, on that, we just need to cancel rent. Uh, you know, just, that's that's going to solve everything. And and I know that I'm sure you're working on that as well. <laughs> like calling the governor, right? <laughs> uh, but back to OCME, because that, that we spent a, we spent some time, and there was a lot of back to or connected to food, even culture, culturally responsive, not just on language side, but really understanding each culture's uh, burial. Um, traditions were, were really important here, especially as immigrants were facing the, the kind of highest impacts. How, do you, can you just talk a little bit about that and, and put a, just a finer point on how you have really accelerated that, that understanding and uh, changed the way that OCME is, is interacting with New Yorkers? Sure, so um, I can say a couple of things and then um, I don't know, Jean, if you have more to add. This is also an area I think you led a lot on. So um, yeah. so uh, I'll say first, we worked um, with them and with HRA on the development of the um, burial assistance application. We secondly worked to ensure that our team actually helped them sort of revamp their website to make it more accessible for people who spoke the top 10 languages. Um, at that time and for information to be easy to sort of navigate in the top 10 languages um, and really focused with them on that, both in terms of what they were developing, but also how it was user friendly to access. Um, you, you know, we worked closely with the team as well and just their sort of, um, as they were developing guidance um, and information to incorporate that into our resource guide. And also as we were getting questions, which were many, and I know your office also was getting many questions, uh, including that in our frequently asked questions and sharing that with them. So we, we sort of worked to try to ensure that the information was clear um, and accessible for immigrant New Yorkers. To your point, in addition to sort of them, and this is just the complicating factor of all of the actors, right? A lot of the things um, particularly uh, went back to consulates. And so that's a little bit separate. And our team worked directly with consulates as issues or cases were brought to our attention. We yeah. actually briefed consulates it, it, during this pandemic um, a couple of times, but also worked on individual cases um, around burials as they each they each have their own uh, sort of requirements and guidance um, when a loved one was was lost here but a family wanted to to um, send the body back home for a proper burial. Got it thank you and and I hope that's really changed not just in the crisis moment but really changed the process information sharing and just attention to tradition as it changes uh, immigrant community to immigrant community. Jane, do you wanna add anything? Yes, actually, so one, exactly to your point, so one of the things that we have worked on, in addition to working on our FAQ to address the questions, for instance, was when HRA, you know, burial um, assistance grant um, in developing FAQs, a lot of the questions that we were trying to address was, you know, is cremation covered? Or, you know, if I tried to uh, repatriate the body to, uh, body to another country, would that be covered under the grant, et cetera? So sort of asking these questions, um, 
um, as we design programs that are there to support um, people who are dealing with the deaths of their loved ones, um, or like if they have to um, locate the body at HNH or OCME, you know, that process, um, et cetera. So yeah, cultural sensitivity and sort of language access are definitely the things that we, um, you know, care a lot about and something that we're sensitive to and have been working with other agencies with. Thank you, and that, that reminds me actually, uh, both to, to Eugene and Commissioner, our, our recent bill that we proposed to create a separate hotline for uh, burial, <clears throat> really to allow for uh, just expertise to be connected directly to people and, and really building out lang language access there. Uh, can you comment on that? I know that's not on this hearing, uh, so I'm putting you on the spot for something that, that we wanna have in full later but is there anything that you can kind of comment on it now as we as we work with you to kind of get ready for a full hearing on that so i can't comment on the bill i guess i can say what we've done what hra has done to be responsive maybe to similar issues that you're trying to address um so we have through the um work that we've done with them to uh, sort of shore up the burial assistance program and making it more accessible, done a number of things. One is um, there is a phone line that people can call um, and receive one-on-one -on -one assistance. Um, we've made sure, sorry? Is that through Moya or? HRA. HRA, okay. Through the burial assistance efforts. Um, so they're really the the experts, right? So the staff that we have staffing that, including, as I said at this moment, IDNYC staff that are bringing additional linguistic capacity to that work. Um, they are uh, able to support people in filling out their application in connecting with the funeral homes and making sure they have all the pieces that they need to get the reimbursement. They have made it easier to, to submit that application by email, via fax, drop it off if they need to. They're really sort of serving as case managers for individuals. If people can't access the application, they will mail it to them, right? So they have really done a lot to make that, you know, more uh, responsive to the needs of New Yorkers who are going through the process. A lot of the challenges are many, right? Because you're dealing with a consulate, a funeral home, right? Like identification of where the body is, all of the things. Um, and so they, they, they're they working honestly as like case workers uh, to assist individual applicants to get them through to the finish line. So there's a lot of effort has been done. I don't know all of the things that you're seeking to address, but a lot of the effort, effort has been done to make that more accessible, but also so that the city team um, is doing that one-on-one -on -one support for each individual applying for the process and to make that application process as easy as we can. Awesome, and we don't have to belabor that here now, but I do want to talk to you about that. Uh, the bill, I, I think, comprehensively addresses some of those pieces, but also there were a lot of things that were changing every day. And so on just the burial part, there, there's an opportunity here to create a hotline where where folks can really understand it and people can call and not flood 311. And and I know you're saying that HRA has 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 a line. So we're really interested in seeing how that works. And and uh, but we'll we'll table that for now. Thank you for for that update. Sure. That work. I mean that's all about dignity. Uh, dignity even in death. Uh, and many of them were immigrant communities that were impacted. So thank you for that work. Um, I want to move over to schools. And I think even, was it just today that the mayor announced a change in, in school openings? Um, I'm not happy with any of that right now, but how has Moya engaged the Department of Education on school reopenings? So, um... I will uh, focus on a, a few things. So one is to say that we've been uh, working hand in hand with DOE throughout the, the pandemic in the spring, but also now at ensuring that uh, families have connection to remote learning devices. Um, you know, what we saw was a lot of our communities, right, didn't have necessarily the access that they needed. And so a concerted effort on our part um, has been really to get information out about how people can access 
that information. Um, additionally, as updates are coming out, we are working with um, our team to disseminate them in kind of all of all of the ways um, that we've been working to share information, to include updates, to work individually with families. We've done so not just as our team, but through uh, sharing of information and, and regular briefings with our Know Your Rights providers, with others, so that this information is more universally um, in the hands of folks that are working directly with communities. Um, we, as I said, have been working closely with DOE on the meal hubs. That's something that we'll continue to do and just ensuring food access as schools reopen remains uh, a priority um, in, in the work that we do moving forward. Um, and uh, there was one more thing I wanted to add and I'm drawing a blank um, around it. Um, you know, I would say in terms of specifics or, or, or issues that are raised with us, of course, we communicate those with DOE um, for their awareness and consideration um, around challenges that either families or communities may be experiencing. And just to add, sorry, okay. just to add one thing to that. Um, so uh, we fully understand that a lot of immigrant families, um, you know, uh, are making tough decisions about um, what to do relating to schools. So as there have been sort of, um, you know, relating to reopening, there have been, um, you know, parent sessions and uh, meetings with the parent-teacher coordinators. Um, we have been uh, part of some of those, um, you know, outreach efforts and actually making sure that they're aware of the city resources that they can utilize to the extent, you know, they need help. And so we definitely made sure that they were aware of the MOYA programs and MOYA, MOYA immigrant resources, as well as um, other city programs that would be helpful for them during this time. And, and again, thank you for that. Some of that has happened in Sunset Park and District 15. So I want to say thank you for, for that work. Um, I, I'm kind of curious about whether or not you know how many immigrant uh, or families with immigrant kids or Im immigrant children we have, uh, maybe specifically LEP students, and what, what, um, what sense of understanding do we have in terms of, of the population itself that may need uh, Moya assistance or Moya attention or Moya um, support? So I, I don't have specific numbers in front of me today um, to be able to sort of share. I think in general, we work very closely with DOE on a number of efforts throughout the year, right? Including provision of uh, legal services at schools, um, including Know Your Rights programming within schools, including dissemination of information in partnership with the council, right, to families around immigrant, uh, immigrant rights, including IDNYC enrollment, right? We do a lot, a lot, a lot with DOE and in general engage a tremendous amount um, and are focused very often on targeting uh, school districts where we know the uh, foreign-born sort of families or populations are the highest. Um, we work very closely with District 79. We work very, very closely with the International Schools Network. Um, a, a lot of that work has continued. I think the um, sort of breadth of the challenge that DOE is tackling and that you're uh, raising here is certainly uh, not lost on us, but I think the specifics um, uh, we've, we've tried to, to do and, and certainly have done is plug community-based providers that we know that are working on these issues and, and have raised with us um, the kind of experiences of their members on the ground into very specific, some of the councils, for example, um, we, we work to ensure that the International Schools Network were a part of those when the mayor announced them. We work to ensure that groups like uh, Make the Road were a part of some of those uh, conversations around reopening so that the challenges that we were hearing could be raised effectively. Uh, and I guess for, for me, I'm thinking a little bit about the work, uh, just to understand the, the nature of the number of people. I guess that's, that's what I'm trying to get a sense of how many people are in need of these services. So if you can, if you can give us a sense of how many, um, because I'm thinking about technological language access support and 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 it and if you really have an understanding of, of how many how many people uh, are, are we are we talking about 
some of the work that you laid out on, on really a lot of the conversations that we just had were supporting mm -hmm. systems like CBOs and others to support their, their membership. But I'm just trying to get a, get a sense from you all about if you, if you have a sense of the, the actual need. Yeah, I mean, what I was pointing to was, yeah, we work regularly with DOE on a number of these issues. I just don't have the number, like, I'm not recalling nor have the immediate sort of numbers. Obviously, it's a school district of about 1.1 million students. There's a large foreign-born population. My my phasey, foggy memory wants me to say that maybe it's about 60%. I don't know if that's accurate, but so I don't want to give you the wrong numbers. Yeah, it'd just be good to have a sense. And sure. And because what we're trying to do, and this is the work in the committee, we're trying to really see a trend in, in the the nature of the population that is in need of service. Yeah. Like all the things that we talk about, and and we're finding that mo whether it's small businesses, uh, et cetera, a majority of, of these families and and folks that we service are immigrant, and yeah. that's that's the point, and really totally, yeah ready for the budget, getting ready for all these things that you're going to, I'm hoping that we work together to really understand what are the resources that are necessary that we're all finding holes and gaps to fill. And that's all about resources. And, and just today that the mayor changed the, uh, or made some adjustments to opening, I'm assuming that now 60% of the folks are going to need a different kind of touch of information and a different language, technical issues, and so how is Moya just today prepared to communicate that message? And how are you really understanding the efficiency and the effective nature of that communication? Yeah, um, I mean, so I won't repeat sort of the myriad ways in which we sort of take the, the like this is a good example, right? This is a critical update that has to be uh, received by you know, millions of New Yorkers across our city, and it has to be done in a way that's both speedy, but also effective. And so it is exactly, this is an example where our, te our team will sort of take it and plug it into all the ways in which we're disseminating information, including one of which I haven't really touched on, but has been hugely important. And we've actually, this is probably one of the areas where we have focused the most with schools on, um, is ensuring kind of two things. One, we're reaching community and ethnic media um, with updates. So we've done roundtables with the chancellor and with others. We've disseminated regular briefings um, to community and ethnic media on schools and school adjustments, um, amongst other things. Um, we've additionally, in partnership with the Department of Health, taken out um, really detailed sort of uh, ads um, around sort of key issues, including food, health, and uh, education being another one. So those are some of the ways I didn't touch on um, that have been kind of key ways of communicating this information um, that we've worked with the DOE on, um, as well as other partners. And so this is exactly, you know, a shift in which we'll sort of look at all of those different efforts. Um, we have a sense, certainly, of what's working, I think, to ask answer your question on efficacy, right? We're trying to see and understand this in different ways. Um, some of it is immediate and you can kind of see the response. A good example of that is our immigration legal helpline. You know, as soon as we sort of pushed out information about it remaining operable, we saw a spike of about 15% in utilization, right? Um, so others are, are harder, right? It's, it's, we're relying a lot on the continued feedback loop. We're relying on continued engagement, working closely with our sister agencies to see what their incoming is and understanding um, if things are having the right impact. I'm sorry, I think you're on mute. Oh. Yeah. Got it. Uh, I, I was just in the realm of education. Uh, we're gonna we're we're gonna see these moments. I know your team is gonna be taxed. The whole thing is gonna be taxed. But how we inch towards better communication is is our goal uh, as we as we move forward. So thank you for that. I appreciate that. Let's move over to the last set of questions, and these are really around something that. The Mayor's Fund partnered up with you on relief for undocumented New Yorkers. 
And my resolution really kind of speaks to a statewide solution. And, um, but on April 16th, even before we are now, the mayor announced a partnership with Open Society Foundation. Uh, the $20 million you spoke of in your, in your testimony brought relief. Um, when was the money in the hands of eligible applicants? Uh, I mean, I, I can't, I don't have the exact sort of initial date. I would say the uh, partnership was announced in April. Um, I think the mayor's fund, um, you know, received the money and as such our ability to lift up the program a few weeks maybe thereafter. Um, when kind of the first dollars um, made their way into the hands of community members, I want to say late May was probably, middle May, late May was probably the first. I'm not sure. I'd want to get back to you with sort of more accuracy on that. Um, the bulk of which was distributed in, in those sort of first couple of months. So May, June, July. Um, and um, we have been working with partners uh, to complete the distribution of the funds, um, which should should be by the end of this month. Um, and we saw early on and often, and we're in regular communication with partners, and I spoke a little bit about this in terms of the demand of the need, and we work closely with elected offices around this, right? The scale of the need has just been so tremendous um, that kind of wait lists um, existed as early as May, right, um, and June, and so uh, providers have really been making their way through um, uh, their their lists um, in order to distribute sort of mechanically the the funds and to um, get them out the door. So, um, yeah, that in terms of timeline, I don't have the exact sort of date as to when exactly money was in the first recipient's hands, but. Um, roughly what I gave you is accurate. Got it. So um, money is still being distribute, distributed even now with the goal of fully distributing the 20 million by the end of this month. Yes. Okay. And when you said providers, are you talking about the CBOs that you partnered up with on the ground in communities? Yes. And were, that, were those providers given equal distribution of funding? across the board? No, so we have a network of about 30 direct um, providers that we contracted with and about 20 additional providers who served as referral partners um, for the program. Um, and uh, it, it sort of varied. Um, a lot of it was based on the capacity expressed to us the, by the providers themselves. Um, a lot of it was based by our own analyses of the data. So understanding, you know, I started in speaking to the undocumented worker population of being about 366, 100,000 New Yorkers. So our team really looking at that and understanding kind of across both what industries, but also what communities um, workers were in and trying to be intentional in dissemination to be responsive. Um, with what we had, right? Look, working with data, working with community providers, understanding capacity, you know, everybody speaks to lots of learnings, um, certainly um, from many of it, many things, um, but, you know, the urgency in which uh, in money needed to get out the door, infrastructure really didn't exist to reach people in, in that sort of expansive of a way. So we had to also develop um, in a couple of weeks, right, an infrastructure for some of the smaller providers in particular to leverage, to get the money out the door, to do so in a way where we centered privacy and confidentiality that made things take a little bit longer, right, um, is in really working out those details and being responsive to what we were hearing the needs were on the ground. So not for, not, you know, not to not take sort of the feedback around the timelines and things like that. But I do think a lot of this has to do with, you know, how, how are we uh, lifting something up that's meeting the needs that's responsive um, and that allows for smaller providers also to be a part of it, but recognizing people are at different capacity levels and can serve different numbers of folks in a shorter period of time. How much money do you have left from the fund? How much do we have left? Yeah. Um, not much. It's a handful of providers 
I don't know the exact number, maybe five or so who are completing the, the sort of final phase of distribution. We also, um, uh, yeah, so we're working closely with them to, to kind of wrap or complete their distribution. Some of the groups got a later start. Some of the groups had a harder time uh, sort of uh, getting through um, their lists. So for various reasons, certainly our intention wasn't to take money away from communities, um, but to kind of work with the providers to give them more time to release the funds. Our initial goal was to try to do so within a two month period, but we recognized that wasn't necessarily feasible for folks that didn't have that infrastructure. Got it. And I want to get into that infrastructure. Really, the, the first question is really the decision making matrix or criteria uh, that you followed for distributing funds to undocumented New Yorkers. Can you talk a little bit about, about, about that to the committee about how you made that decision in the first place? We talked about how, how it got distributed to the CBOs, but how did you make the decisions on who got money? Yeah, well, we, you know, we work closely with the Open Society Foundation, um, I think, recognizing early and often, as many did, what, what, what it would mean, um, both because of public charge, but also um, all of the restrictions that the, the uh, safety nets have on access to resources for undocumented families. So we very quickly sort of worked to understand what impact could look like and who might be left out of sort of key uh, resources. Um, and as soon as the, the stimulus was announced, the CARES Act, and it was clear what the exclusion was going to be for undocumented individuals and mixed status households, um, we really centered on that. Right, um, we sort of centered uh, emergency relief access for individuals who would be left out of that stimulus um, as the sort of primary eligibility criteria uh, to look for to ascertain somebody's eligibility for this grant. So if you you know if you weren't eligible for that, if you were low income family, et cetera, and you'd experienced some loss, right? You could express to us you lost employment, you lost some income, um, then you would be eligible for this. And we didn't make this arduous at all. The goal, of course, was to make it as easy as possible for folks who were suffering at this time to engage um, with, with trusted providers and to express this need and to access the resource. And, and you mentioned capacity. Some of these organizations had capacity at very varying uh, uh, ways and abilities to, to get this money out. Were organizations compensated for their work from the city from in a different way, in a different uh, funding stream, separate and apart from the funding that we're, we're gonna, that we're going directly to families? Yeah, so the mayor's fund in contracting with the providers did provide an administrative um, amount or percentage, depending on the nature, the, the grant and, and in most cases what the organization expressed to us um, was needed. Um, additionally, we supported, uh, you know, obviously other admin aspects of the program, including mailing and things like that. And we're, are you getting good feedback from that? I know, I know we're going to hear from some of the organizations in the next panel, but um, were you getting positive feedback about that support? Or um, potential changes about the capacity? Sure. So I, I mean, I can't, I can't speak for every provider. I will say our team is conducting an evaluation of the program itself to ensure that we, uh, in a more systematic way, have uh, the feedback um, and can inform future efforts like this in terms of, you know, was the admin cost sufficient? Did it address all of the needs that you had as an organization? If so, or if not, why? We've already gotten some of that. Um, it was a range of admin costs, again, based in part on the, the um, what was initially expressed by the grantees. Um, and I think some of that has informed even continued conversations we've had with other cities, with other philanthropic partners about the, them thinking about setting up systems like this and what's necessary to support the capacity of organizations at this time to do so. Is that something you can share with us after you've completed? Sure, yeah. Uh, thank you. And again, I think these are these are things that we want to anticipate both the state fixing their issue with relief, but also 
uh, making sure that you have what you need and our organizations have what they need. Uh, if in fact they were um, met with more burden to, to administer this because the city didn't administer this, it were, they were nonprofits that were dealing with so many things. And I think we're gonna hear that in some of the panels uh, as, as we get to them. Uh, can you talk a little bit about data privacy? I and mean, this is something that, that you and I talk about a lot in ensuring our data is private. Uh, what did you ensure in the process or how, how did the process ensure that throughout, throughout this program? Yeah, I just want to give a little bit of credit where credit is due. So my team got no money to do this work and my team worked till midnight, I think many, many, many nights to continue to operate this program. So I just want to give credit where credit is due, uh, both recognizing what the experience of providers were on the ground, but also that um, to, to, to sort of program manage this program was not easy to lift it up in a short period of time was not easy and we made it work, but that meant people worked a lot of hours. So I just want to acknowledge that. Um, thank you for, for yeah. doing that. I thank them for that work. Um, so uh, in terms of your question around privacy, yeah. So um, again, this was part of, you know, in, in looking at a, a number of things. One is sort of without a federal or state infrastructure where people are already receiving the benefit Right, and you can sort of channel a benefit um, through an existing uh, median. EBT is a really good example, right? Or pandemic EBT even, where there's like a roster of people um, who are able to receive that benefit because they have school-aged children who are registered and the schools have that information. That looked very different than what we were trying to do, which was literally to reach a population where we've done everything that we can not to create lists, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, and so that was a pivot, or a, you know, needing to do so in a new way, um, but also to be responsive to need, to the concerns that folks might have um, in accessing the resources. So obviously, starting with. Um, the community-based providers as sort of trusted places or locations where people could receive the benefit was hugely important. Um, additionally, we did a couple of things. One is through our contracting with the providers themselves. There's very strict uh, restrictions on what information can be collected and how it can be stored and how it can be accessed um, and what uh, requirements are to be had if, in fact, there's any requests for information related to the program it, by way of notice. Um, we worked really closely with the financial partner that we ended up contracting with through the Mayor's Fund um, to not only ensure that they weren't collecting any personal information, so no names and information of the um, uh, individuals receiving the benefit, um, but that all that they had was aggregate information, right? Um, and that, that, that in turn was all that we had as the city. So we don't have any personal information either, our no names, no addresses, et cetera. We further ta attached a rider or a additional, so additionally required um, sort of provisions around privacy and confidentiality that we worked really closely with our chief privacy officer as well as the law department to develop on the contract. Um, and we uh, lastly actually had them adjust one element of the program that makes the card in some ways easier to use online where you would have to register it. We asked not only for them to develop notice in different languages, through their website, but we required the provider, we developed one in different languages that we required the providers to give to individuals so they had notice and consent if they were to, to use it in that way. So lots, so, you, so if you can imagine from like April to May, lots went into um, developing this in a thoughtful way and certainly we'll learn hopefully more from the, the feedback that we receive in the evaluation on what, what worked and what was challenging, but lots of learnings. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for walk, walking me through that. And um, I think you mentioned that the city city's not keeping the information. I just want to get clarity that the mayor's fund is also not keeping any information. Is that true? Yep. Okay. And so we so have aggregate data. Aggregate right. data. And yeah. no, essentially no one is keeping information 
uh, except for, well. The community-based organizations okay. have, have the personal information. Everybody else just has aggregate data. Awesome, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, some of the CBOs that have historically served specific immigrant communities and have specific language ex expertise, and I think a lot of them are the ones that you just kind of spoke to, were approached by a diverse array of immigrant New Yorkers in need. So, you know, immigrants went to CBOs sometimes for the first time. What support, including staffing and language assistance, did Moya offer to these participating CBOs? Uh, and that was one of the things that I even didn't anticipate in terms mm -hmm. of just the new need that arose. And, and I think we're seeing that. We talked about food. Food will continue to be in need and it might even grow over time as the economy continues to do what it's doing right now, as it struggles, how, um, how are we supporting those CBOs to ensure that they have everything they need, even with new, new immigrant populations are approaching them? Because they are trusted partners in, our, in these neighborhoods and they're going to them before they're com coming to us as government. Yeah, I can't necessarily, and I don't know, Gene, if you can speak too much to the specifics of your question. I'm not sure it's come to me in that way um, or been elevated in that way exactly. I'll just say a couple of things. One is um, we di we disseminated our resource guide, um, again, in, in 25 languages to all CBOs that we work with um, across all of our both programs and outreach and engagement, recognizing, of course, that simply because you're um, primarily serving one population, that doesn't mean that that's the only population that might you might be reaching out to, might be reaching out to you. So that that's one. Um, again, in in looking at sort of the meal hub distribution, making sure that there was accessibility um, at those locations. And in terms of this is something we've done more broadly with our legal programs. So just making sure that. The legal service providers have the ability to access interpretation services as they're serving New Yorkers in different languages, right? One of our goals with that program was to ensure that uh, some, some level of, or some sort of ratio of a centralized appointment making system so that communities that maybe don't have a strong uh, capacity around immigration legal services can still access those from providers that have the expertise. So that's something that we have since the outset built into that program. It's uh, so not new to uh, that sort of concept, if you will, it's not new yeah. to us. We're not something we haven't thought about, but I don't know if in this moment, Jean, there's anything more that we've either heard or responded to if you wanna add. Well, in terms of the, I think, obviously the best thing we could do if you could would be providing money to CV organizations because that's what they need, but that's unfortunately not optimal yet. Um, so in, but in terms of providing other assistance that they need, um, there are multiple things that we have done. One was, um, I know that you have asked the question about, you know, um, the OSF funding provider selection process. And, um, you know, there was a lot of thought that went into it. And one of it was that we didn't want to just limit it to, you know, um, community-based organizations that had like, are known to have a lot of capacity and being able to do because different CBOs reach different communities. So, you know, in closely working with them to make sure that um, even the ones who may not necessarily have the largest capacity still can, um, you know, have um, sort of a, a connection um, through this fund was, you know, one of the ways. We have been, a lot of times when CBOs come to us, um, you know, that's a very uh, good way for us to figure out what's going on on the ground, et cetera. But um, they usually reach out to us because they're looking, uh, trying to access certain CV services or trying to figure out what the city policy is, but they're having a hard time working with the agencies or finding the right person. So our outreach team and community service team usually work very closely to make sure that, you know, those things are sort of, I consider Moya to be a lot of times working as kind of a bridge between the, you know, other agencies and the uh, providers that are on the ground. And that's the work that happens you know, just about every day, I get those emails all the time. And so in that sense, I think we, in a day-to-day -day work, work very closely with them to make sure that we provide support. Thank you, thank you for that. And and I guess this is my last kind of point, and then I'm gonna hand it over to our committee council, Harvani Usha. But um, this, the pandemic caught 
us all off guard in a lot of ways. It was, uh, it was not only abrupt, but it had so many different complexities to it. And I think there's a lot of learning. So as much as you can share with us about the learning of the programs with the committee, that'd be great. We wanna support you. Uh, we understand that that is not Moya's decision to the funding questions, but it is our discussion collectively. And we're hoping that you really build out a funding request that supports not just your institute, your institution as well, because you were taxed people working till midnight and the nonprofits to build out a system, whether it's going to come from the city next time or uh, or another foundation. But there's a lot of things that we can do better. And and I think that's that's the that's the that's the message here. We are relying on on organizations on the ground that need to stay alive. And there are a lot of organizations that are going out of business right now as nonprofits because of capacity issues for a lot of different reasons. The more healthy they are, the more healthy this whole thing is, and the more people we can reach. The most vulnerable people in our communities are immigrant, undocumented immigrants. So I know we have the same vision and the same goals. The question is how we can, can work together to achieve that through funding. And we are expecting a $10 billion cut in the next budget. What does that do for us? And so I really want to make sure that we, we do something different and innovative this year on the budget and we do that together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I will now call on council members for questions. Council members, as a reminder, if you would like to ask a question of the administration, please raise your hand using the Zoom raise hand function now. Seeing no hands, we will uh, close this panel. Thank you, Commissioner and uh, Ms. Bay for testifying. Thank you, Commissioner. Good to see you. Thank you so much. Likewise, nice to see many faces. <laughs> Be safe. We will now turn to public testimony. I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, we will be calling on individuals one by one to testify and each panelist will be given three minutes to speak. Please begin once the sergeant has started the timer. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should raise their hand using the Zoom raise hand function, and I will call on you after the panelist has completed their testimony. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you, and the sergeant at arms will give you the go ahead to begin upon setting the timer. Please wait for the sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. I would now like to welcome our first panel to testify. I'd like to welcome Marianne Therapel followed by Susanna Saul, and then Alba Lucero Villa. Marianne Therapel, you may begin when you are ready. Good afternoon, honorable chairperson and Good committee members. Begin. Oh, my name is Marianne Therapel, and I'm the director of special projects for immigrant and refugee services at Catholic Charities Community Services, Archdiocese of New York. We are grateful for today's hearing on the effects and recommendations addressing immigrant exclusion in the COVID-19 response, both at the state and federal levels. On a daily basis, members of our legal staff encounter immigrants who are struggling due to the impact that COVID-19 has on them, their families, and their community. They're struggling to understand next steps in their immigration cases, losing jobs, facing eviction, combating hurdles to access educational resources for their children, caring for elderly family members, and confronting rising fears of leaving their homes for basic necessities as unwarranted enforcement actions targeting brown and black communities continue to rise. This moment of enduring strife yet again highlights the disparity in access to justice and life subsisting resources for black, indigenous and people of color immigrants. These resolutions serve as necessities for human dignity, needs that existed prior to COVID-19 that have been exacerbated by this pandemic and confront obstacles that continue to stall due process for immigrants and harm fundamental humanitarian beliefs. Now, more than ever, we, the legal service provider community, need the council's support, financially and through advocacy, to protect our Black, Brown, and immigrant New Yorkers. Catholic Charities strongly supports resolution number 1399 put forward by Chairman Chaka. Catholic Charities also recommends continued efforts to halt changes 
to the public charge rule, which has a chilling effect on the most vulnerable New Yorkers, dissuading them from accessing much needed benefits. Throughout the last six months, Catholic Charities provided over $4.4 million in direct relief assistance to 28,000 people living in 8,000 households. This is a mere fraction of the overall need. I'd like to share just one story from the thousands served. Rosa came to the US as a young child to escape brutal gang violence in Honduras. Now 20, she has been supporting her mother and other relatives through her job as a server, which she lost due to Corona closures. She hoped to save some, some of her earnings for college, which she started this fall. With the help of Catholic Charities and the non-governmental dollars provided, Rosa was able to pay for, her, for rent for their apartment in Brooklyn and groceries for her family. This need continues. Catholic Charities also strongly supports resolu resolution number 1404 put forward by public advocate Williams. As legal providers navigate the myriad of issues facing immigrant children and their families, day laborers, and si simultaneously con confronting potential funding cuts while legal needs continue to rise, we implore the city council and this administration to support legal providers like Catholic Charities who are responding to the pressures forced onto immigrants by this federal administration and that are only further complicated by COVID-19. Through our hotlines and the Immigration Court Help Desk, Catholic Charities has engaged with hundreds of immigrants seeking assistance with these unknowns. Given the confusion and concerns legal representatives on Time is up. face on behalf of their clients, imagine the complete lack of clarity facing an immigrant without counsel, facing language access hurdles, and forced to navigate this uncertain time alone. This testimony and the individual story shared from the thousands of immigrants that Catholic Charity serves highlight immigrant community exclusion from both state and federal recovery efforts and the exhausting plight of BIPOC immigrants and those privileged to ab advocate for them. It is essential that we, elected advocates and providers, unite in the fight to ensure that support, safety, and dignity are provided for all who call New York and America home. We thank the New York City Council for its vision, leadership, and determination in protecting New York immigrants, and I thank you for your, your time today. Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to now call on Susanna Thal. You may begin. Hi, good afternoon. I wanna thank the City Council and the Committee on Immigration for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Susanna Saul and I'm the Director of the Immigration Practice at Her Justice. For a nonprofit organization that takes a pro bono first approach to provide free legal services to women living in poverty in New York City, by leveraging the pro bono power of New York City's law firms. And we practice in the areas of family, matrimonial, and immigration law. And I'm testifying today to lift up specifically the experiences of our clients who are undocumented immigrant survivors of intimate partner violence and other forms of abuse. I'm here to advocate for the urgent deployment of sufficient funding and services for the needs of all New Yorkers in this crisis. We call our clients survivors for a reason. They have experienced unspeakable trauma and violence and have come through it because they are resilient, resourceful, and they're focused on creating better futures for themselves and their children. But the current crisis is creating a situation that is sending many over the edge of poverty and health, both mental and physical. The situations that exist right now speak for themselves in terms of the great needs that our clients are facing. So I'm just gonna to describe to you three clients from many that we're hearing about all day, every day. Amelia experienced abuse by her husband for 29 years. She separated from him last year and now lives with her 19 year old daughter. Amelia is diabetic and was infected with COVID-19 but recovered. She does not have health insurance and has to pay out of pocket for her medications. Her daughter is recovering from cancer and also can't work. Amelia worked for part-time for a dry cleaner but lost her job when the owner of the business died from COVID-19 in April. And since then she and her daughter are subsisting on her daughter's SSI payments which don't cover her rent. She relies on friends in her community to bring her food and her aunt brings her supplies like soap and detergent and she will likely be facing eviction as soon as the moratorium ends. Anna lives with her four children. Her abusive partner was paying the rent and they can't afford the rent anymore after a domestic violence incident. She fears eviction and is looking for an affordable place to live, but she has four children. And so even when her public assistance grant is approved, she'll likely be forced into an overcrowded housing situation with her children. Terry was living with her abusive husband and called the police on a recent um, incident of abuse. She wants to go into shelter, but she was told that there was no space. She's still waiting for space in a shelter. 
I want to note that all of the survivors above are eligible for immigration relief, but because of the backlogs in immigration, they won't obtain any status or work permit for at least four years, and they're all living with the fear of deportation. Some of our clients are working and some are not. Many are providing essential services. And it's cruelly absurd that in our current crisis, these workers are considered both essential and also illegal. The systems that were set up to serve our undocumented clients are failing. Undocumented survivors are also forced to rely on whatever social safety nets they have in their communities, but their safety nets are thin or non-existent because of the abuse and isolation. With fall and winter coming, the needs of the survivors are gonna grow exponentially. The eviction moratorium is a solace, but it's temporary and precarious. And the other vital need that undocumented New Yorkers are facing is access to technology. Many social services systems are operating, but only virtually or remote, and our clients don't have access to computers. And they're increasingly unable to afford their smartphones, their cell phones. So they're not gonna have any connection to help without an, in access to the internet or phone. And Can also with that? libraries closed, you could usually access computers there, but they're closed. So they're not gonna be able to access food, legal assistance, mental health support, and health care. The health and safety of these individuals and their children are at risk. Please, the city council must infuse additional resources into the existing systems and also call for the accountability of these systems to make sure that nobody falls through the cracks. COVID-19 has taught us that when we neglect human life in this city, all of our lives are put at risk. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to now call on Alba Lucero Villa. You may begin when you are ready. Your time will begin now. Thank you. I wanna thank committee chair Char Carlos Manchaca and the rest of the city council for holding this very important hearing. My name is Alba Lucero Villa and I'm the executive director of NMCIR, Northern Manhattan Coalition for Immigrant Rights. Since 1982, NMCR has been serving New York City's immigrant community, working tireless to educate, defend, and protect the rights of immigrants. Most of the clients we serve are from low income, um, are low income immigrants from the Caribbean, Latin America, Africa, and the Middle East. Some have lived here their entire lives. Um, others are recent immigrants. Some are undocumented. Others are legal permanent residents who are still in dire fear of deportation. And often their first experience with any kind of basic legal services or social service is an MCR or a similar organization. Before COVID-19, I could tell you that on any given year, we served about 8,000 families. But in the last few months, in one month alone, we have received about 4,000 calls for help. And it's not just for legal services or immigration related matters, it's for food and cash assistance and just any kind of assistance that we can provide or we can point them in the right direction to. So the COVID-19 pandemic has really exposed many of the systematic failures of our country and the disparity that exists in communities of color, particularly in the larger immigrant community. Today, you heard from Enoch, one of our worker center participants, about the discrimination he faced as an immigrant worker and how the pandemic changed his life and how NMCI's worker center helped him survive when he lost his job as a restaurant worker. You, work, you heard how he works from sunrise to sunset seven days a week just to put food on his family's table. But what he didn't tell you and was that this morning at four in the morning, his cousin died. He was his age and he left behind a small child and a pregnant partner. And yet when I told him not to worry about coming and testifying, he begged me to let him come because for him, it was so important to have a voice and to have his voice heard today in front of all of you. He rushed off to a family service because as a family, they are uniting to figure out how they're going to help that small child, that his wife and his unborn child survive now that his cousin is no longer here. NMCR has met the challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic by working with like, with workers like Enoch, and we've rapidly adapted our programs to meet our clients and communities needs. We never ran a pantry. We don't have food for, funds for food, yet with the support of local businesses, with donations, we figured out how to distribute foods and meals every week since March. We stayed open um, during the pandemic. We continued dispatching jobs. We distributed uh, PPE to workers. We ran legal clinics, we did know your rights, we did work weekly worker meetings and distributed with the help of um, the mayor's fund and Moya, more than 850,000 in cash assistance combined with individual donations that we received and fundraise. And we did this all <coughs> while I was trying to juggle the fear of furloughs and funding cuts of our own. 
and keep my staff healthy and safe and employed. So our worker center, just to give you an example, a fully operating worker center with a physical space. Your time is up. Um, really did everything we could to stay open, despite it being really difficult. I was appointed to Mayor Bill de Blasio's Labor and Workforce Sector Advisor Counselor, and in discussing alongside with fellow leaders, one thing became clear. The only way to move forward for an inclusive recovery is to put worker centers at the forefront of leading that effort. As New York City continues to reopen and think about the threat of a second wave, we won't be able to fully address any disparate impact of COVID-19 on communities communities of colors without properly funding the grassroots organizations that serve essential workers who have worked long hours along inside dangerous conditions. So despite being a lifeline to our community and the organization itself being immigrant led with 98% staff of color, our existence too is vulnerable to funding cuts. Any funding cuts would only deepen the disparate impact of our communities of colors in this pandemic. So we must recognize that immigrant New Yorkers are often living in an unimaginable fear, not only of COVID-19, but of their mere existence in the US. They're not gonna call 311 for help, but they will come to us. So I implore the city council to really seize this moment in history as an opportunity to be on the right side of change by providing community-based organizations with more resources, not less than those we need to be able to serve our communities. Thank you. Thank you, Alba. Thank you for your testimony. I'll now call on Chairman Chaka for any questions. Um, I, I, I don't have any questions. Everything that you have stated has uh, accelerated my commitment to you to build protections for all of you who are doing so much of the work um, that were demanded of you. Um, and so thank you for your for your testimony. And I think you're going to see a lot, a lot of that um, through the panels. And so I made it very clear to the commissioner who did a great job of holding a lot of that funding whole in in the last budget. I don't know if that's going to happen again with, with $10 million on its way for $10 billion of cuts that are on their way. Um, and so this story needs to stay stay solid and in, in front of people. Um, so that OMB and the commissioner can deliver yet again for, for our communities with the support of the city council. So thank you um, and my best to Enoch and his, and his family. Thank you, Chair. We will now turn to questions from other council members. Council members, um, again, as a reminder, you may use the Zoom raise hand function if you have a question. Seeing no hands, uh, we will move on to our next panel. Our next panel, um, I'd like to welcome Manuel Castro to testify next. After Mr. Castro, we will hear from Ana Lilia Leon, Ligia, Ligia Gualpa, Yesenia Mata, and then Nadia Marin. Manuel Castro, you may begin when you are ready. Thank you, and thank you, you will begin. And thank you to the Committee on Immigration and to Chair Carlos Menchaca for inviting us to testify on this really critical hearing today. My name is Manuel Castro, and I'm the Executive Director of NICE, New Immigrant Community Empowerment. Uh, and I want to share a little bit about you know, our, our work on the ground, um, but also a result of our major survey that we have been conducting over the past six months. Since the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic in New York City, NICE has been responding to the, the crisis from our worker center in Central Queen, providing everything from thousands of pounds of, of food assistance, nearly $2 million in cash assistance, and helping dozens of families with COVID-19 um, burial assistance. Um, at the same time, we've partnered with CUNY and surveyed 6,000 immigrant families and workers all register with our organization on the impact of COVID-19 on their lives. Families and workers who did not qualify for COVID-19 relief benefits, such as the CARES Act and unemployment benefits, most undocumented immigrants, uh, newly arrived immigrants, uh, day laborers, cleaning workers, and other low, low paid uh, workers, uh, it primarily in Queens. So like I said today, I'll focus my testimony on our preliminary findings of this survey, but I'll make sure uh, to get the full report to, to this committee and to the council so that you can see for yourself the kinds of uh, 
uh, experiences our members in this community have had to endure over the past six months. Uh, our survey really presents the picture of great hardship due to the pandemic, but most critically, an increase in alarming vulnerabilities on immigrants in New York City. Uh, not just the physical, but also the mental health aspects of this uh, COVID uh, pandemic on both the families and the children. Uh, and so at, as a result, it created uh, or has been creating uh, as we, as we uh, analyze the survey's findings, a picture of uh, a community at very high risk. So for instance, 38% uh, of the respondents of the survey uh, said that they had symptoms, uh, COVID related symptoms. This is a number three times higher than uh, the 11% of all New Yorkers that responded to the same question. Moreover, NICE's survey shows a shocking 10.4 of the respondents reported a family member had died due to COVID-19. And so uh, this is exacerbated uh, because of uh, the lack of access to healthcare in this community. Respondents feared seeking medical care despite uh, you know, the, the, the news and, and, and the importance of seeking this medical uh, uh, assistance. 54% of the time is up. That the, the, there was fear of seeking medical care uh, due to their irregular status. And 49% said that they fear seeking treatment because someone in their family was undocumented. Uh, also, before, before I break, uh, I'd like to mention the economic impact of the families. 90% uh, of the respondents uh, said that they had not worked in the prior three months of the pandemic. Uh, and by June, 99% of the respondents said that they had 0% of savings left. Uh, this is most critically because uh, many of the respondents said that this might lead to homelessness. 75% of the responses, respondents reported being at risk of homelessness. Uh, this is particularly worrisome because of the nice respondents with children, uh, they had 2.2 uh, children per household. So uh, this, this is a tremendous amount of information that we can use to point to the grave uh, uh, emergency that our community is, is dealing with. Uh, lastly, I'll say that, you know, in the next couple of months, NICE will be focusing on making sure that our communities have access to the potential vaccine and to make sure that they get accurate and reliable information. I think that's something that we have to start thinking about as a community. And uh, I'd like to say thank you to the, the community count, the city council, uh, to the members of this committee, especially our council member, Danny Drum, council member Francisco Moya, uh, council member Carlos Menchaca. We've only been able to do this work because of the years of support from the community council and the infrastructure we've been able to build as a result. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank Manny. you for your testimony. Um, next, we will turn to Ana Lilia Leon, and we will have uh, Ligia Gualpa helping with translation. Your time will begin. Ana Lilia, you may begin when you are ready. Sí, ya estoy ready. Hello, buenas tardes. ¿Me escuchan? Sí. Sí. Buenas tardes a todos los presentes. Mi nombre es Ana Lilia Olión. Soy miembro del proyecto de justicia laboral, trabajadora de limpieza. Agradezco sinceramente la oportunidad y el espacio que ustedes nos brindan, el Comité de Migración y el Consejo Municipal de la Ciudad de Nueva York para hacer posible que nuestras voces sean escuchadas y se tomen en cuenta nuestra existencia y nuestra contribución en tiempos de pandemia. Antes de la pandemia trabajaba yo de limpieza a tiempo completo a partir de la para pagar mi renta y mi comida. Cuando llegó la pandemia me quedé sin trabajo Una primera, la primera semana vivimos en tiempos de miedo, angustia, desesperación y saber qué iba a pasar con todo esto. También enfrentamos el dolor más grande de perder una familia. 
Mi cuñado murió de coronavirus en Brooklyn. En esta pandemia lo único que tuvimos fue, fuimos nosotros mismos para seguir saliendo adelante. Mientras la ciudad cerró, mi organización, el proyecto de justicia laboral, se mantuvo abierto para ayudar a la comunidad inmigrante. Durante la pandemia, trabajadores de limpieza formamos un comité para coser y se llama Hilando Sueños. Hicimos más de 2,500 mascarillas y otras que donaciones de mascarillas que les dimos a los trabajadores esenciales y las repartimos en las calles. Más aparte, dimos despensas, alimentos de comida caliente para la comunidad aquí en nuestro centro de Williams, de Sunset Park y Williamsburg en Benson Head. No es para presumirles, pero fuimos más las mujeres que tuvimos en las calles desde nuestro centro liderando las respuestas de emergencia y la solidaridad de la comunidad. En este tiempo de pandemia, mis compañeras y yo aprendimos a cocinar un buen sazón y nos unimos más como comunidad. Aprendimos como solo el pueblo salva al pueblo, porque estuvimos con nosotros. A pesar que este país se beneficia de nuestra mano de obra y los impuestos que tenemos que pagar, el gobierno federal no estuvo ahí con nosotros, que lo más ese día los necesitábamos más. Ahora, mientras la ciudad reabre la economía, somos nosotras, las mujeres que trabajamos en limpieza, que estamos desinfectando y limpiando esta ciudad sin protección y expuestas a morir del COVID de los, y de los quimos, químicos tóxico, tóxicos. Necesitamos una ayuda económica y aliento migratorio. Mientras para hacer que las voces... Your time is up. Gracias por hacer que nuestras voces de los inmigrantes se hagan escuchar. Gracias. Muchas gracias, Ana Lilia. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm going to briefly translate um, what it was said. Uh, my name is Ana Lilia. Um, I am a house cleaner and a member of Worker Justice Project. Thank you for the opportunity to testify um, at the immigration um, hearing. Um, my Before the pandemic, I had a full-time job as a cleaner to pay my rent and my food. When the, when the pandemic hit, I was out of work. The first week, we lived in fear and despair without knowing what will happen. We also faced the greatest pains of losing a family member. My brother-in-law died of coronavirus in Brooklyn. In this pandemic, the only thing we had, it was ourselves to keep moving forward. While the city closed, my organization, Worker Justice Project, stayed open to help the community. Um, During the pandemic, it was women um, that formed a committee to make um, um, and distribute 10,000 safety masks for essential workers. This we distributed food pantry, hot meals from our center in Williamsburg, Sunset Park, and Ben Sarhant. It is not to show off, but it was we, the women who were in the streets and from our centers leading all emergency response and solidarity work in the women. In this pandemic, my Colleagues and I learned how to sew, cook uh, food with good seasoning, and became more united as a community. We learned that the only people save the people because they were because we were um, together. Although this country benefits from our labor and the taxes we have to pay, the federal government was not there uh, when we needed them the most. Now, while the city. Re Yeah, I think we lost you. Oh, yeah. Okay, I think there were some technical difficulties with Lihia. Um, we'll come back to her if she's able to get back on. Um, in the meantime, we will turn to testimony from Yesenia Mata. Your time. We'll start now. My name is Yesenia Mata. I am the executive director of La Colmena. I want to thank Chairman Menchaca for holding this critical hearing at this critical time. And thank you to your staff of powerful mujeres, Lorena, Elizabeth, Harvani, for working with us to ensure workers have a voice. 
La Culmena is a Staten Island-based worker and immigrant rights organization. Like some of my colleagues here, La Colmena kept his doors open during the pandemic because we knew we needed to be a space for immigrant families to speak up. At a time when the world was shutting down and the federal government failed to appropriately respond to the COVID-19 pandemic, immigrants were losing their jobs, getting sick and dying from, deadly, from the deadly virus. We recently released a report with the Worker Institute at Cornell University to highlight the struggle of Stein Island's uh, Latinx immigrant community during one of the most difficult times in our nation. I want to highlight some key findings of the report, which include that despite their economic and social vulnerabilities, working class immigrants, um, Latinx immigrants spend more than 91% of their income on housing and basic uh, consumer goods, serving an essential source of revenue for local businesses on Staten Island. 88% of surveyed workers uh, were unemployed for three months, losing their jobs between February and the beginning of May. For the vast majority of these workers, 97% uh, did not qualify for unemployment benefits and did not receive uh, a government stimulus check. 98% of the workers also did not qualify for any sort or any form of pandemic relief. The exploitive working conditions that immigrant workers experienced prior to the COVID-19 crisis, including high instances of wage theft and discrimination and a lack of formal work contracts, workplace protections and paid sick leave uh, will persist and deepen during the reopening plan in the abs absence of a policy changes pandemic relief and a statewide initiatives um, that would adequately address these issues. Um, I submitted the full report to the committee and I really look forward to working with you all to ensure that our immigrant community is not forgotten during these times. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. We'll now go back to Ligia Guapa. You may begin. Yeah, are you there? Okay, I think she still might be having technical issues. Um, we'll move on. Um, next, we will be hearing from Nadia Marin. You may begin when you are ready. You may begin now. Um, okay, thank you. Um, thank you for uh, giving us the opportunity to give testimony. I'm here on behalf of the National Day Labor Organizing Network, NDLAN. Um, NDLAN has 60 member organizations now nationwide, um, and many of them are day labor centers, similar to the ones that exist here in New York City, um, including La Colmena, Worker Justice Project, Northern Manhattan, Coalition for Immigrants' Rights, NICE, uh, Catholic Charities in the Bronx, and all of them have provided their own testimony and detailed reports. We just wanna begin by expressing our support for the resolutions um, of council members Menchaca, Eugene, and Moya, and public advocate Williams, um, without going into details, but just thank you for highlighting the crucial issues and for calling on the state and federal governments to support and create policies um, that support rather than persecute and exclude um, immigrants. I wanna highlight just a couple of them and then add a, a few recommendations. Um, on, the, on the moratorium on deportation proceedings, um, recently the New Orleans Worker Center for Racial Justice wrote a letter and we signed on to it along with many others, calling on the Department of Homeland Security to have an immediate moratorium on enforcement due to the devastating emergency caused by Hurricane Laura in Lake Charles in Louisiana. But DHS has refused to stop the enforcement that terrorizes the immigrant community and in moments when they're most vulnerable to exploitation as workers and as community members who need help. Hurricane season is just beginning now and it's on track to be particularly devastating this year. And New York City now has to prepare, respond to the current pandemic, um, prepare in case of hurricanes um, and then also you know, um, 
deal with the additional terror that's caused by ICE enforcement. And I think it's, it's you know, we'll, I'll talk a little bit more about how to do it, but effectively it's dealing with crisis on top of crisis on top of crisis, right? Um, on the exclusion of undocumented workers from relief funding, when the pandemic began, our members knew that day laborers and other immigrants would be excluded from their federal response and from state despite contributing billions of dollars. We created an immigrant worker safety net fund and we're proud to have distributed about a million so far and continue to do so. But we also did a report and I'm going to attach it with the, the testimony. And one of the findings of the report put together by Professor Nick Theodore at the University of Chicago is the importance of support for organizations in addition to the cash assistance for individuals. So we're calling on the city to work directly with day labor centers, designate them, work with them as emergency response centers to recognize the work that they do, connect them to the current emergency preparedness and response infrastructure, which will strengthen the city's work and strengthen the work of the organizations at the same time. Um, continue to work on strengthening health and safety. Your time is up. And support also the statewide legislation that's creating, that would create the fund for excluded workers, um, S8277, because that would uh, that would create a fund where excluded workers would be able to access the funds, undocumented, formerly incarcerated, and other excluded worker populations. We really appreciate your support um, for day laborers and all immigrant workers. Thank you for your testimony. I'll now turn it back to Chairman Chaka for questions. Thank you, Harbani. And I just want to say thank you to the whole, the whole panel. Uh, you've You've done incredible work in the last six months, and I think we're at a critical point where uh, that work has not slowed down at all, uh, and you are needing more resources, support, and so thank you for that, for that testimony really pointing to the, the tension issues. I want to I wanna talk a little bit about the fund uh, and your partnership with Moya and the Mayor's Fund and the Soros funding that came in. Uh, can one of you talk a little bit about what that, what that impact, how that impacted your organization. I heard a lot of positive things as well. And so I want to, I want to lift that up that you were able to get funding out to families, but this is the opportunity right now to share with me, uh, the public, but also the committee and the council uh, on, on what worked and how we can support you in capacity issues or other things that we can, we can uh, anticipate it uh, moving, moving forward with crisis move coming in in the future uh, or even another phase of COVID. That wants to speak on that. Uh, Alba? Okay, there we go. Um, thank you. So I, I want to say that the the most helpful, um, obviously, in addition to having funds to redistribute, because there was no way we would have been able to raise that amount of money to to deliver. Um, I think what was very helpful is having the money come in advance, right? And so while I have to say that about myself, I was so worried about just getting money into the hands of community members that I, I told everybody, just give us money, even if you don't give us any administrative costs, give me money, I want to distribute, right? That was my initial feeling. And then fortunately it came with some, um, you know, some administrative costs, um, which I was more than happy to take any of it because I, I just wanted any kind of money. But it, it was actually a huge undertaking and I, and I was fortunate to have the staff capacity at that point. It was um, early on and so I still wasn't, you know, uh, making a dollar out of 10 cents. I was making a dollar out of 50 cents for my staff, but I was able to really put my whole staff on the project and we got it done and it worked out. A few months later, you know, I'm running into reduced hours. How am I going to pay my staff? How are capacity issues? I don't know if I would have been able to, to deliver right that now versus a few months ago. Um, so having that that the cash advanced um, was critical for us to be able to do it. And you know, it, it's something that I wish all our city funding contracts were like and and could do because we wouldn't be in the capacity constraints that we are as a small organization that you know relies heavily on on um on city council funding 
if we got money up front and spent down. Um, the previous organization I ran was mostly foundation run, and so we got the money, did the work. Here was we do the money and like we pray and hope for the reimbursements. And I understand that it's a complicated procedure, but having that be different in this instance, I think was very helpful. Um, that said, and it took a lot more time, staff time um, and everybody's time than I ever imagined. Um, I think a lot of us had had huge challenges. We got it done. Now, if we were given the same amount, I don't know if we could do it um, because of our constraints, because of the you know the the funding cuts that have happened, the the looming ones. Um, and so I I would you know what I say now would be different than I would say a few months ago. I think we would need definitely a lot more money and administrative support. But I do want to commend the the that the the money was was paid first and enabled us to really you know get that get what we needed and didn't have to do the work. But for NMCIR, you know, we had 24 people on this. If I didn't have 24 people on this, I'm not sure how I would have done it. Thank so. you. Thank you for explaining that. And I think that that speaks to capacity uh, today versus yesterday and capacity in the future. And so yeah. I think the goal here is to keep you all alive, but not just alive, allowing you to thrive in this environment and really institutionalize that engagement to communities who are vulnerable and are coming to you before they're coming to government. And I think that's the important piece, which means that you are a vital component to government work, non-governmental, uh, as, as a non-governmental agency. And so I think that's gonna be an important thing to ensure that we get the message across the city council through our budget negotiations. I don't know if council member uh, and chair of the finance committee uh, drum is here, but these are the kind of things that are important to tease out. You're not just a provider of service, you're in an emergency way, providing a very vital service. Uh, and so I saw uh, Yesenia Mata and Manny Castro raise their hand. Can we, can we unmute them and uh, give us a little bit of uh, maybe something new that we haven't heard so, so far? So just, um, I, I think, um, as you mentioned, Chairman Carlos Menchaca, uh, day labor centers have at times been overlooked, um, but in situations like, like these, we have been very vital, if anything, um, doing the work that um, some elected officials haven't done or are not even doing, and that is exactly what happened here in Stein Island. We weren't getting any help until this day. We haven't received any help from any elected official. And when this pandemic hit, where, you know, when I tell everybody, where do you think everybody was going? They kept coming to La Colmena. And it got to a point where it was um, it was scary and it, and it was stressful until this day. It's stressful. I haven't, and, and in all honesty, it's like, and just so, and, and, and it's, this is a reality, I haven't taken a day off since the pandemic hit. I've been here every day on site. And, um, and, and again, with no help of, of, of any elected official here on the island, we haven't, if anything has been us figuring it out. So with this mayor's fund at the time when it came, um, obviously we were very excited because we wanted to support our immigrant community economically and, and, and we, we think that the administrative costs did come up front and I think if any if that's the type of support that we should be receiving getting administrative costs up front. Um, but one of the things is that once we did have the fund we didn't realize the amount of work it was going to be. And, more. and the amount of work it was going to be for example, I mean, we're providing all these vital services, legal services, food distribution, um, and, and dispatching people and, and responding to everything that's being thrown at our immigrant community. But also with, with this fund, that was something additional that we had to do in it. And, and I didn't have a team of 24 people. And I think Alba brought it up very well. It requires a team of 24 plus people to be able to do this because to screen people, it requires a lot of work to upload the funds. That's additional uploading the funds. On top of that, to schedule people to come and pick up the cards, or if you even, if you even send it by mail, that is also frustrating because you don't know if it's gonna get to the person and the people call and they're like, well, I never received my cards. Where, where's my card? So you see, it's all these fundamental things. So our our office 
um, and we have recorded the amount of calls. We received over like 6,000 phone calls. Wow. And it got to the point then, not only that, but when people heard that La Colmena was giving money or whatnot, like there were so many people at La Colmena every day. Where, you know, we want money. And, and we understood the, the, what they were going through. And it was, it, if, if, if in the future this is provided, more administrative costs must be provided, more support must be provided also um, I, from the mayor's office, not just give the money, here's administrative costs, but there should be more support, um, especially to organizations like ours that are not just doing um, services um, via web. No, we are doing services on site. And, and that was very frustrating until this, I mean, we're still, we're stressed still. So that's, that's a reality of what was going on when it, it came to distributing these funds. Thank you, Yesenia, for uh, for that uh, just the clarity on it. Uh, I want to I want to allow uh, Manny Castro to talk a little bit about uh, this this question, and I see Councilmember Drum as well uh, raising his hand. So I'd offer an opportunity for him to ask a question. Yeah, thank you, uh, Councilmember. I just I just want to say, or I want to send a big shout out to the day labor center organizations because despite of all the challenges, despite the heavy lift, I think the headline here is that we were able to take on this money and disperse it to our communities on record time. I mean, this wasn't like 30,000, 40,000 dollars. We're talking about millions of dollars that needed to be dispersed urgently to undocumented communities. And I think there were no better organizations to do this than our, you know, uh, the organizations here, uh, we're talking about La Colmena, WJP, Northern Manhattan Coalition for Immigrant Rights, Catholic Charities, and like really that should be lifted because uh, it was a tremendous amount of work. On our end at NICE, we were able to support about 2,000 people in small increments of money, and we were able to lift up uh, like this uh, sort of infrastructure and do all of this in one month. I mean, like, you know, let's look at, frankly, let's evaluate who, who else could do that, you know? And let's think, let's think about that, you know, what else could we do in partnership with other uh, city agencies? I'm, I'm thinking about housing, right? There's a housing crisis right now. How do, how do these agencies look to us and support us in building infrastructure to get that support to, to our communities? I'm thinking about healthcare. I mean, there's just a lot of things that, we're ready and able to work on together, uh, but that support and infrastructure needs to continue. And I'd like to say, this is nothing new. I, was, I myself was an intern at an organization working to help uh, undocumented immigrants after 9-11. And so I saw the same issues that I'm seeing now. And then we're talking about 19, 19, 20 years later, right? And seeing the same issues, same thing after Hurricane Sandy, we have to remember how day labor groups and day labor workers like really stood up for New York. And we're doing the same thing again. And I hope no one forgets that. Uh, and thank you so much for this. And I know uh, council member Joe wanted to speak and really I wanna say that our communities felt that, you know, council members really, especially council member drumming in Jackson Heights, we really felt your leadership, your, your staff, you know, uh, really championing our issues and, and our needs in, in, at the front line, in the grassroots. I mean, when, when members are coming to you saying that your, your family members are dying, their family members are dying, and it's a lot on staff, right? And, and to have the support of the council is very meaningful. Because often you feel like, you know, you hear the news and you feel like, what is government doing? You know, but at the, at the least, we know that the city government has our backs. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Manny. Councilmember Drum. Am I unmuted now? Can you hear me? Yes, your yep. time will begin. Okay. Thank you, Chair Chairman Chaka. And um, I just want to say thank you, Manny, for the compliment. It's a pleasure to be able to work with you. And the work that you're doing in the community is so wonderful and so vital to uh, the residents who live here in Jackson Heights and Elmhurst, to our day laborers, the Moraleros. Uh, I, I'm very, very happy uh, to be able to work with you. Um, I just want to go back to the other uh, woman who was from Staten Island. And I just wanted to know, because uh, Chairman Chaka mentioned as the chair of the Finance Committee, um, 
we pretty much held, if I'm not mistaken, Chairman Chaka, um, uh, immigrant groups, um, you know, um, uh, um, they didn't get any cuts in terms of the existing budget. That's right. Um, so I'm just wondering, am, am, am I right? That, that's correct. That's yeah, correct. Okay. So you, you were fighting, I know, in BNT. And you were hold them, you know, um, you know, painless so that they did not get cuts. So the woman who was from Staten Island, has she applied for funding? Does she know how to apply for funding? Has she asked the uh, city council members from Staten Island for funding? And is she part of the bigger pot of, um, of immigrant uh, funding that um, we have? And, and uh, if we can unmute Yesenia to talk a little bit about, uh, about that. Uh, everyone that spoke today did receive funding from the day labor uh, funding that the city council gave. And maybe Yesenia, you can talk a little bit about support that might not be coming from the funding that the council gives, but other support you might be looking at from council members or other elected officials from Staten Island. Perfect, yeah, so um, that, that's a really good question. And so when, when like I said before, when the pandemic hit, um, immediately everything was closed here on Staten Island. The only center that did remain open uh, was La Colmena. We did keep um, promoting that and indicating that we were out here and that we needed support. That was a time when my staff itself is very small and I should have said that before, like my staff is very small and my staff in itself was here every day trying to, um, to support the community. And, it, it, and we did, um, try to reach out to certain elected officials and people just saw all the work that we were doing. And again, no one no one at the time was, or it still has came to even provide any, or, or try to help this uh, to say like, hey, you know, you could apply for this type of grant or you could apply for these type of service. And, and it's, and in my thing, it's like, it, 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 this is where it needs to stop that. I, I, I get sometimes a bit frustrated when people tell me like, why don't you reach out to this elected official or you should do this? Like why in times like this, in times of crisis, where my center itself is trying to maintain itself self open, where I am here every day and so in my staff risking, risking our, our, our lives every day here, right? It has to come to a point where elected officials it's, I'm, and I'm talking here specifically on Staten Island, do their job and go to those centers that are open. And it's obvious that we are open. When you come to La Colmena, the amount of people we have here, the Latinx immigrant, the amount of actions we have done, it's just, it, it's, it, it, I guess they just got back to that point, right? That we've, we've been here, we've been asking people for support and the only individuals that have came out to support is like Catholic charities, chassis that have provided us food. And we've had partnered up with these, with these um, organizations. Um, also New York Immigration Coalition and the lawn, um, Gualitas that gave us those, the, when they saw the work that we're doing, you see like, they, this is the work that elected like, officials should be doing here on Sinai Island. Like when and the lawn, Gualitas, New York Immigration Coalition and saw the need they, and, and, and the mayor's uh, Moya, they they gave us money. The Catholic Charities Chassis gave us food. Um, all these other um, nonprofits came out and said, "Can we come and volunteer?" So, it has elected officials come and try to sit down with us and say, "Can we help you apply for this grant or for this service?" No, they haven't. And okay. we would like to Thank you. It's well, that's why it's a, it's a good thing you're on this um, at this hearing. Because and now you now you've been heard and you've been heard by me, the finance chair. So we'll try to see what we can do to help you. I mean, it's a very difficult time, obviously, because of the pandemic, even with council funding. But uh, with uh, Chairman Chaka, we'll try to work a little bit more closely with you as well. Um, so keep up the good work, and I hear you, um, and my heart goes out to you. I just want to thank you, and 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 we'll follow up and make sure you're you're heard more. Thank you, thank you, Chairman Chaka. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank I am going to have to jump because I have a 3.30 call. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Thank you so much. And uh, like you said, we'll follow up and maybe we can organize some electeds in Staten Island to just re-engage and, and help. Yeah. Uh, and it's been a great hearing. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Council Member. I'm now going to call on Lihia Guelfa. Thank you uh, so much for um, allowing me to briefly share my thoughts 
on the emergency response, but also um, quickly respond to actually the question that was brought up as well in terms of the cash relief. Uh, my name is Ligia Walpa. I'm the executive director of Worker Justice Project. Uh, we are also a worker center that has been on the front lines responding to the COVID-19. Uh, we specifically run three worker centers throughout Brooklyn covering from the north, which is Williamsburg to central south, I mean to central uh, Brooklyn, which is Sunset Park and Benson Hearts. Um, as a workers uh, center, we have uh, reached out close to 8,000 workers, um, literally as Ana Lilia said, uh, distributing almost uh, 12,000 masks to workers, um, offering uh, close to $2 million in cash relief, um, and most importantly, providing organizing um, and legal uh, support to workers that were facing with labor rights issues and housing issues. Um, and I'm just going to stop because I, I, I know a lot has mentioned already in terms of the role that Worker Centers has played um, in the recovery. And I just don't want to add because um, I think a lot has been said, which is very similar work that has happened um, in Brooklyn. It's very similar to other parts. I do want to um, highlight, I think, the importance. Um, many of us worker centers um, in Worker Justice Project Brooklyn, I think we would have not been able to do the emergency response work if it wasn't because a lot of our organizations had the infrastructure thanks to the Day Labor Workforce Initiative. Um, the day labor workforce initiative i think built um, something important which is making sure that there is dignified spaces for workers not only to continue to organize but really to transform and reinvent ourselves as emergency response centers and i i cannot highlight the importance of um, understanding how vital day labor centers are and the importance of keeping um, and engaging day labor centers not only to see us as like, yes, we're doing great emergency response work, but thinking through about what role we will continue to play in rebuilding the infrastructures that are needed to rebuild in our neighborhoods. And I'm specifically thinking about um, a lot of our worker centers have become hubs, not only for food pantries, have become hubs um, for mask making, uh, mask making has become hubs where workers have relied on to use bathrooms when a lot of like delivery workers couldn't use. Um, so now we're thinking too about how not only continue to support and fund worker centers, day labor centers specifically as emergency response centers, I think we continue to forget that workers also play a critical role as emergency responders. Your time is so up. Nine, I'm just going to close with this. We saw it on 9-11. We saw it on, on um, when Hurricane Sandy hit. It was not only worker centers that were doing the response work, but it was also day laborers themselves who were risking their, their lives to do food delivery, deliver cash, um, do masks, go out in the street. So when we think about who are, not, who are the emergency responders, we need to start thinking not only worker centers, but also day laborers and how we prepare and equip um, worker centers and workers as emergency response centers and infrastructures that we need to build for the next wave of COVID-19. Yeah, well said, well said. Thank you to this panel. Thank you for your testimony. Seeing no other council member questions, we will be moving on to the next panel. I would now like to welcome Elizabeth O oh to testify. After Elizabeth, we will hear from Sophia Grule. Rebecca Espinoza, Nyasa Hickey, Michael J. Etroff, and then Rex Chen. Uh, Elizabeth O, oh, you may begin when you are ready. Your time will start. We Elizabeth, I'm sorry, I think you're having an audio issue. Um, we'll work on resolving that with you. In the meantime, I'm going to pass it to Sophia Grule. You may begin when you are ready. May begin. Good afternoon. My name is Sophia Elena Grule, and I'm the policy counsel to the immigration practice at the Bronx Defenders. 
I also represent immigrant uh, New Yorkers in deportation proceedings through the New York Immigrant Family Unity Project, also known as NIFUP. The Bronx Defender strongly supports all resolutions before the committee today, but highlights specifically the public advocates resolution calling on the DOJ to issue guidance that establishes EOIR protocols in times of public health crises, as well as Councilmember Eugene's resolution calling on DHS to halt all deportation proceedings for the length of the COVID-19 pandemic. Through NIFA, the Bronx Defenders has represented hundreds of people in deportation cases before EOIR. And since before the pandemic began, EOIR struggled to develop and maintain sensible case management protocols due to policies and practices that deliberately tip the scales against our clients and create often insurmountable barriers to meaningful review of their claims to remain in the United States. The current crisis has exacerbated EOIR's pre-existing problems. EOIR's response to the coronavirus, particularly in New York, has been chaotic and irresponsible. From the beginning of the pandemic, advocates, including the Bronx Defenders, sent a letter to EOIR requesting courts to shut down immediately. EOIR did not respond. On March 15th, EOIR partially shut down by halting non-detained master calendar hearings. Still set for their trial dates in non-detained courts, many people came to court risking their own health and safety, even though many judges failed to show up without any notice to the parties. On March 17, advocates sent a follow-up letter urging the complete closure of immigration courts. And on March 18th, non-detained courts shut down nationwide. What has followed has been an ongoing timeline of fast changing contradictory information about how and where filings would be accepted, as well as the status of reopening the non-detained courts. This system sets people up to fail and failure means deportation. Currently, EOIR emails the status of reopening non-detained courts on a weekly basis, creating uncertainty and anxiety for advocates about whether court appearances will or will not occur due to the limited notice. Basically, if you're not signed up with EOIR to receive these notifications by email, for example, if you are unrepresented by legal counsel, as is common with many immigrants facing deportation, then you are unlikely to know the status of your court date. And if you don't know whether your court date is still scheduled and don't show up to court accordingly, the consequence is deportation. EOIR, EOIR must create protocols that take into consideration the people who they demand to appear in court rather than decide whether the court, courts will reopen on a whim and with minimal notice to parties. Beyond the non-detained courts, EOIR's detained courts have remained open during the coronavirus pandemic. Detained cases in New York have been occurring at Barrick Street with confusing and contradictory messages about which judges would be available, how counsel should appear, and whether filings would be accepted electronically. Bronx Defenders has joined other organizations and multiple communications with the court to highlight the dysfunctional operations and ask for reasonable accom accommodations. These requests have been met with extreme delay or outright denial. Your time is up. UIR issued a standing order for telephonic appearances applicable to one immigration judge alone on March 21st. In response, advocates sent another letter to the Varick Street Immigration Court highlighting the deficiencies of the court and requesting something more comprehensive. Even ICE prosecutors joined this letter, marking unprecedented agreement between the parties who are traditional and regular adversaries. However, the court administrator, administrators never responded to this request either. In response, instead of a response, they transferred all the cases to Fort Worth, Texas with little information about where to file documents, how to communicate with clients, and whether cases would proceed as planned. Attorneys were often not even called for their cases, even after filing motions for telephonic appearance and calling the court themselves. For attorneys who were able to, to connect with EOIR in Texas, the cases were often delayed because they could not file find their own filings or their own case files. While the cases have now mostly returned to Barrick Street, meaningful advocacy for our clients is nearly impossible due to barriers related to attorney-client communication, barriers to gathering documentation for bond and relief from deportation, and general chaos in detention facilities. Though telephonic appearances are now the norm, EOIR's refusal to shut down the detained docket forces attorneys to represent their clients in impossible circumstances. For people incarcerated in ICE detention to bear their most horrific traumas by video screen without even being able to see their own attorney in the courtroom. In light of these experiences, the Bronx Defender's position is that while this crisis continues, all immigration courts should be shut down, all incarcerated people should be released from ICE detention, and all deportations must come to a halt. No person should be incarcerated during a global health crisis just to ensure their appearance at an administrative hearing, and no one person should be deported and separated by their family. Thank you. Thank you, Sophia, for that. 
Thank you for your testimony. Next, we will turn to Rebecca Espinoza. You may begin when you are ready. My name is Rebecca Espinoza and I am a social worker with the immigration practice at the Bronx Defenders. I work with individuals with open immigration cases on issues related to mental health, substance misuse, trauma, domestic and community violence. I'm here to talk about resolution number 1399. For immigrant New Yorkers, access to state and local public benefits means the difference between meeting basic health and safety needs and experiencing the trauma of resource deprivation or see seeing your children go to bed hungry. And for many NYC immigrants, it is a matter of life or death. Recently, our client Gabriel, a longtime NYC resident, was arrested by federal immigration officials when ICE agents came to arrest his roommate and he drew their attention while translating for them. He was subsequently detained and ended up being the first person in the country to test positive for COVID in ICE detention. Nauseated with a fever and unable to stop coughing, Gabriel thought that he was going to die in a jail cell. When Gabriel was finally released due to the support of his legal team at the Bronx Defenders, he told me he felt relieved that he would now be able to get the medical care that he desperately needs. But it hasn't worked out that way. It's been months since Gabriel has returned to his community and he continues to suffer from shortness of breath. His chest tightens up and he's unable to walk 10 steps before feeling dizzy. He is connected to a medical provider but can't afford medications prescribed to alleviate his symptoms. He lives every day with an affliction derived from ICE detention. Additionally, Gabriel is ineligible to receive assistance for food and other essential needs. Unable to work and rent a room of his own, he's currently living couch to couch and getting by with food pantries when they have food available. When he found out the city had funds that would be distributed to the undocumented community, Gabriel told me he felt hopeful that this was a sign of better things ahead. But when he heard about the amount of funds allocated, his tone changed. With that one-time grant of $400, Gabriel had decided whether to buy medicine so he can breathe, or pay his phone bill for his mandated ICE check-ins, or try to get food for himself, or financially provide for his younger daughter. A one-time relief is not enough. I can also talk to you about Jessie, who lost one of her two jobs due to COVID, and every single morning, she sorts out a small amount of food for her five kids, three of which are non-citizens and therefore ineligible for benefits. Or about Isaac, who traveled 20 minutes on public transportation at the height of a pandemic, all the way to a food pantry that had run out of food by the time he arrived, only to return home to an illegal lockout from his rented room. The exclusion of an entire population of New Yorkers from critical safety nets is creating an anguish that will only continue to clog an already overbooked system of shelters, overburdened healthcare systems, and strained support networks to the point of collapse. The federal government has deliberately failed all immigrants and the city has similarly failed to fill in the gaps. We urge the city council to pass resolution number 1399 so that every New Yorker, regardless of immigration status, has access to basic necessities that should have never been denied to them in the first place. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. We will now turn to Nyasa Hickey. You may begin when you are ready. Starting time. Hi, my name is Nyasa Hickey. I'm the Director of Immigration Initiatives at Brooklyn Defender Services, a public defender office and NIFA provider. Thank you for this opportunity to testify today. BDS supports all of the proposed resolutions and in our written testimony, we've made some additional notes about the resolutions. For example, the Immigration Court should issue a nationwide standing order on filing evidence, telephonic hearings, waiver of respondents' presence, and hold regular stakeholder meetings to discuss the functioning of the court. As Sophia also said, um, went into much more detail about the immigration court needs. In addition, all ICE enforcement should be halted nationally, and we hope that the governor of New York State will sign the Protector Courts Act to codify the illegal use of courts as stalking grounds by ICE. Despite the drop in detention of new individuals from April to July 2020, BDS NIFUP's team experienced no slowdown in our work whatsoever. Again, as Sophia highlighted, individuals were detained and in very dangerous conditions in immigration detention centers. We filed enormous numbers of groundbreaking habeas corpus petitions documenting in great detail that ICE was holding vulnerable people in conditions that threatened their life and health. At the end of July 2020, BDS again started to receive calls from terrified families whose homes had been violently raided and loved ones who had been kidnapped by ICE in the early hours of the morning. 
Unbelievably, the immigration jails are once again accepting newly detained immigrants with a complete disregard for the health and safety of individuals and the community. As we have um, been throughout the pandemic, NIFOP staff will continue to fight this unjust and dangerous practice before EOIR and the federal courts. Given the essential role of NIFOP during a crisis with no end in sight, the council's ongoing support and Chairman Menchaca's ongoing support of our immigration pro programs and universal access is important, now more important than ever. We've made some, um, excuse me, we have extensively documented the needs and challenges faced by immigrant clients during COVID in our written testimony, job loss, housing insecurity, illegal evictions, food and financial insecurity, difficulty accessing medical care and COVID testing, language access and technology barriers are just some of the predominant concerns that were highlighted by um, in our written testimony and also have been highlighted today. We also identified five recommendations in addition to the continued support of NIFOP de deportation defense funding. One is to establish an emergency cash assistance fund to provide urgency finan urgent financial relief to undocumented workers who've been disproportionately impacted and excluded from almost all state and federal relief efforts. Two, expand food provision and distribution in ways that ensures accessibility to immigrants who face barriers such as access to identification, language, transportation, and technology. For example, the food distribution Time expired. through the DOE school program was very successful and was actually very accessible to our immigrant clients. And I go into more detail about that in the written testimony. Three, cancel rent for the duration of the crisis. If rent is owed after the eviction moratorium is lifted, landlord harassment and and evictions will skyrocket and immigrant clients will be the most vulnerable. We've already seen illegal evictions happening throughout COVID. Four, ensure everyone has access to comprehensive health care regardless of their immigration status. And five, increase the capacity of government workers to help people understand their benefits and rights over the phone in multiple languages and to accommodate for people who are unable to read or do not have access to a computer. I'm happy to answer any questions or highlight some client examples as we also have done in our written testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. We will now turn to Michael J. Etroff. You may begin when you are ready. Starting time. I'm an attorney with the New York Legal Assistance Group. I'd like to thank the council and specifically the Committee on Immigration for an opportunity to testify. I'm going to speak today about one of our clients affected by the Trump administration's presidential proclamations restricting immigration. U visas are available to violent crime victims who cooperate with the authorities. Applicants can include spouses and children under 21 in their applications. But once an applicant files for a green card, these family members lose eligibility. Where this happens, the applicant can file a new petition for her family member, but child beneficiaries, child beneficiaries of the new petition must enter the United States before turning 21 years old, or they could lose the ability to immigrate for decades. On April 20th, 2020, after the city had shut down due to the COVID pandemic, the Trump administration announced Presidential Proclamation 10014, suspending immigration to the US for most visa classes. The administration included a national interest exception, but it didn't specify the criteria. At the time the proclamation was announced, NILAG was representing Myrna, a domestic violence victim who had been granted a U visa in 2013 and later a green card. Myrna filed a new petition on behalf of her child, Isabel, then living in Mexico. Isabel was also the victim of domestic violence and years of harassment by her father. The petition was approved and Isabel then filed an immigrant visa application. When the proclamation was announced, the lone remaining step for Isabel was her visa interview at the consulate. NILAG and Senator Kirsten Gillibrand's office had advocated for an expedited interview as Isabel's 21st birthday was in June. But when COVID struck, she had yet to be scheduled. Then the US consulate suspended regular visa processing and the proclamation was issued. NILAG and Myrna joined the lawsuit challenging the proclamation. In the meantime, Isabel was scheduled for an emergency visa interview in late May. Although NILAG submitted a compelling argument that Isabel qualified for a national interest exception, 
At her interview, Isabel would not, was not asked any questions about the exception and was refused a visa. The litigation team promptly filed for a temporary restraining order. The government then reversed course and issued Isabel the visa in order to moot out a sympathetic plaintiff. Isabel recently reunited with her mother and sister in the Bronx. Without the representation by NILAG, as well as the litigation team, Myrna and Isabel would still be separated from each other. Sadly, though, there are countless other New Yorkers and their family members now separated from one another because of these cruel immigration bans that serve no legitimate purpose. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. We will now turn to Rex Ken, followed by Hassan Shafikala. Um, Rex Chen, you may begin when you are ready. Starting time. My name is Rex Chen, and my pronouns are he and him. I'm the Immigration Director at Legal Services NYC. We are the largest civil legal services provider in the country. In 2018, we gave immigration assistance to households in which over 23,000 people lived. Let me talk about Resolution 1404. It would help everyone learn what health measures the federal government will implement for immigration court hearings and the way they decide whether to hold hearings for people who are not detained. The resolution says that EOIR delegates to each local office the power to decide whether to hold hearings. You know, that might not be accurate. A court administrator told me this week that the decision actually comes from EOIR headquarters. It's really hard to know who's deciding. Months ago, EOIR told people that it was the U.S. Attorney's Office that decides, but we've reached out to them and they can't find any information suggesting that they really have that power. Legal Services NYC even sued EOIR in April, and in the course of that, we didn't find out who is making the decisions. Uh, the resolution can try to help us find out who is even making that decision. Uh, let me mention something that's not in that resolution. Resolution 1404 doesn't include any demand that EOIR produce information, data, or stats about the health measures it implements, how well it's going, or how many staff or visitors test positive for COVID. Adding those demands would probably help keep EOIR accountable. Uh, I'm gonna turn to resolution 1399. The needs of the community are very large. Legal Services NYC, led by our great social workers, mobilized quickly and creatively as early as March to start raising money for those in need who didn't qualify for public benefits. And we even started getting funds to them in April. Uh, and we have not been anywhere close to meeting the need. Despite the great efforts by many, we had our program, Maya talked about its program, the need is still there. Turning now to resolution 1416, uh, one thing is that uh, there's a concern about, uh, that talks about the deportation proceedings and we want DHS to stop them. Uh, I just wanna talk briefly about immigration court hearings. Those are actually run by the Justice Department, not DHS in the Executive Office of, for Immigration Review. Uh, if the resolution leads the government uh, and the Justice Department to stop deportation proceedings, meaning stop all immigration court hearings. I just wanna point out that actually might hurt some immigrants who actually are really eager to get an immigration court hearing as soon as possible. There are some protections that you can uh, only get in immigration court. And for some people, it's critical to get that hearing now. For example, if you wanna get something called cancellation of removal for those who don't have status, you need to show exceptional hardship to a qualifying relative and you want a decision before your child turns 21. Something that could be clarified is that you can still allow those who demand a hearing to get it even while stopping these deportations. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I'd like, now like to call on Hassan Shifakala. You may begin when you are ready. Starting time. Hey, good afternoon. And thank you to Council Member Menchaka and all the council members um, for convening this hearing. My name is Hassan Shafikul. I'm the attorney in charge of the Immigration Law Unit at the Legal Aid Society. Legal Aid, like, like all the partner agencies um, in this hearing, have been on the front lines of responding to the pandemic. We've lost um, clients to COVID. We have staff who've been sick and are doing our best in the, in the midst of difficult circumstances. Um, together with our partner agencies in NYFA, the New York Immigrant Family Unity Project, Brooklyn and Bronx Defenders, we've been fighting to get people out of um, COVID infested jails in the middle, you know, in the midst of the pandemic, where ICE is refusing 
in most cases to voluntarily release our clients. And so together um, through mix of habeas petitions in federal court, bond hearings in immigration court, and in rare instances, convincing ICE to exercise its discretion and grant humanitarian parole, we've secured the release of many medically vulnerable individuals, but a lot of our clients are still languishing in detention. And it's alarming that ICE is starting up its um, enforcement activities and putting people into jails at a time when they really should be releasing everybody because civil immigration enforcement should not come with it, the threat of a death sentence. Um, like all of us, we've been fighting on behalf of our clients who are on the non-detained docket, even though hearings are suspended at the moment, deadlines have not been told. And so we're continuing to fight to um, respond to requests for evidence and try to get documents from agencies that may be closed. And we're trying to explain that it's in some cases impossible to give the agent, you know, to the court or USCIS the documents that they're requiring. Um, or like with USCIS sending our clients in to get medical exams in response to requests for evidence for their adjustments, even though going into a doctor's office could be putting them at risk. Um, so I think those are sim similar to what, what all of the agencies are doing. I just wanna highlight one thing that Legal Aid has been doing with our law reform unit, which is fighting against the public charge rules. Um, we had gotten a, a nationwide injunction, um, which was then stayed by the Supreme Court. And then during COVID, we got a nationwide COVID related injunction barring the Homeland Security public charge rule from going into effect because a pandemic is not the time to scare people away from getting life um, saving health care and other benefits that they need. That unfortunately was just enjoined by the Second Circuit, but we're continuing to litigate that um, at the District Court and at the Second Circuit and preparing to um, defend an appeal to the Supreme Court on that, both the Homeland Security rule and the um, Department of State rule. Um, in terms of all the resolutions that are currently under consideration, we wholeheartedly endorse all of them. Just a note about Resolution 1399, um, Props to the um, city council for, for backing this one in particular. It helps um, to counteract some of the horrible language in the 1996 welfare reform law that Clinton signed into, Time into law. Time um, expired. And opens the door to welfare benefits for non-citizens. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, I'm not seeing any council member questions. We will be moving on to the next panel. Um, I'd now like to welcome Ravi Reddy to testify. After Ravi, we'll be, here, we'll be hearing from Hallie Yi, Iranya Pillai, Jihei Fisher, and then Francis Wong. Ravi, you may begin when you are ready. Starting time. My name is Ravi Reddy, and I'm the Associate Director for Advocacy and Policy at the Asian American Federation. I want to thank the committee for giving me the opportunity to testify today. Overall, Asians make up 16% of the city's population, approximately seven in 10 were born abroad, and about one in five Asian immigrants may be undocumented in New York City. As Commissioner Mostafi and numerous council members have acknowledged, the COVID-19 pandemic has created an unprecedented crisis for all Asian New Yorkers. So amidst a 35% increase in deaths over the five-year average and a 6,000% increase in unemployment claims compared to this time last year, but this crisis hasn't slowed down this administration's effort to hurt our most vulnerable populations at the exact moment when they need access to government services and are working on the front line themselves. Days ago, an injunction we and our partners won that would have stopped the application of the Trump administration's cruel public charge rule during the COVID-19 pandemic was stayed. But let's call this rule what it is, an attempt to erode the family-based immigration system that brought generations of Asian families to the United States. And despite this rule's limited scope, many families are nonetheless disenrolling out of fear. And COVID-19 hasn't stopped ICE from continuing detainments that will likely pick up once New York City reopens. While our immigrant community works on the front lines, on the front lines for the rest of us, they deserve access to quality in language legal services in pursuit of all available options to remain in the country. Citywide language access efforts are critical to help our most vulnerable. Asian small business owners, 88% of whom are immigrants, are facing immediate difficult decisions regarding store closure and bankruptcy. And Asian seniors isolated by the pandemic are utilizing services that reflect their values and ethnic identities, as committee chairman Chaka mentioned, through community organizations instead of the city. So here's what we're asking of the committee. 
The city must actively communicate with current and past benefits recipients, regardless of citizenship status, that federal rule changes do not impact eligibility for benefits. The city can do a better job of encouraging eligible beneficiaries to maintain their access to services and to do it in language. Aside from sanctuary policies to curb excessive ICE enforcement, additional investment is also needed to help grow capacity for immigrants serving community organizations providing in-language legal services alongside Know Your Rights and Immigration Emergency Response Training for Frontline Workers. As several council members acknowledge, the city must also better address the desperate need for timely language access by New Yorkers seeking services from their government. This can be done by providing better funding and support for CBOs who are already familiar with the matter, have community buy-in and are asked to provide translations or create a mechanism for central uniform translation by city agencies. We believe in the work we've also been doing over the past three years alongside several other CBOs to create a language bank to expand translation services for as many immigrant communities as possible. And we ask the council to find ways to support this effort. Underfunded CBOs need focus delivering services rather than creating translations unless better funding can allow them to do both. With that, on behalf of the AAF, I want to thank you for engaging us on the important immigration work before the City Council. The Asian American Federation will always stand with our immigrant community and we look forward to engaging individual council members and this committee on how we can address the needs of immigrants in every district and across the city. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Now I'd like to call on Hallie Yi. You may begin when you are ready. Starting time. Thank you. My name is Hallie Yi, and I'm a policy coordinator at the Coalition for Asian American Children and Families or CACF. I wanna thank Chairman Chaka and members of the Committee on Immigration for giving us this opportunity to testify. Um, CACF speaks on behalf of our highly immigrant APA communities today who have been left behind in the city's COVID response and must be centered in the discussion of revitalization as they face greater challenges and loss due to this pandemic. I won't go into a lot of the statistics because Ravi did a great job prior to me, um, but especially with the public charges, public charge rules, chilling effect that has already been a reason for disenrollment and general lack of enrollment in public benefits, our immigrant New Yorkers need access to state and city benefits regardless of their status to ensure health and safe New York for all. Because of this, on behalf of our 70 plus organizational members and partners serving the diverse Asian Pacific American communities across New York City, we support each of the resolutions being proposed today with spe special attention to Chairman Chaka's. Immigrant New Yorkers have been at the forefront of the state's fight against COVID-19, representing one third of the state's essential workers and playing a key role in all sectors of our battle against the pandemic from food production and delivery to construction and frontline healthcare provision. This ongoing exposure has contributed to the disparate outcomes in COVID-19 infection and death, which have disproportionately afflicted immigrant communities of color. The connection is clear. By failing to provide meaningful ongoing access to affordable health services, the state is exacerbating COVID-19. The pandemic presents a grim opportunity to see the life and death consequences of this inaction. The resolutions presented here today offer an opportunity for New York State to seize the moment and take a step towards equity in healthcare and in legal services for the communities suffering most acutely from this crisis by temporarily ensuring access to affordable health insurance and more. Furthermore, for our city to continue phases of reopening, we have to think more than the 3% citywide average transmission rate threshold that city is focused on. Um, I'm, as I'm sure Chairman Chaka is aware, Sunset Park, for instance, has had many, has had a very significant spike and having no um, tracking of disproportionality like that is detrimental in the long run. We are asking city council today to hold our public health systems accountable to our community's needs. We demand the city provide accurate data collection and disaggregation of data on infection rates, hospitalizations and deaths in the APA community um, disaggregated by race and ethnicity. Second, we demand that the city's health system in partnership with schools ensure that the critical information gets to families in the languages they need. And third, we demand the city address the mental health needs of our children and families, especially those who are East Asian presenting who have been targeted during this pandemic. Our communities are consistently overlooked in the distribution of resources, and this pandemic has highlighted a myriad of city safety net systems, and the city's response must address root problems in addition to immediate needs. 
Our community will continue to suffer every day we allow these flaws in the system to exist. As always, CACF will continue to be available as a resource and partner to address these concerns and look forward to working with the city to better address the inequities we see day in and day out within our communities. Thank you, Ellie. Thank you for your testimony. Next, we'll hear from Sharanya Pillai. You may begin when you are ready. Starting time. Um, thank you. I thank Chair uh, Carlos Machaca and the community on immigration for helping India Home provide for the South Asian community and um, helping um, you know, my fellow panel members uh, during such difficult times. My name is Sharanya Pule. I am Deputy Director at India Home. The mission of India Home is to improve the quality of life for older adults by providing culturally appropriate social services. India Home addresses the growing needs of senior center services, which include congregate meal programs, case management, health and wellness programs, creative aging programs, and various one-on-one -on -one services. During this pandemic, India Home quickly responded to the needs of the South Asian senior community and has continued to serve an even higher number of clients than ever before. We have been tirelessly working to make sure the immigrant community gets accurate information, resources, and language through our individual wellness checkup calls. We have prioritized food security and quickly started a culturally competent home delivered meal and grocery program which serves meals to 111 seniors three days a week and have served groceries to over 800 seniors to date. Our dedication to reducing social isolation and promoting health and wellness continues as we have transitioned to virtual senior programs including informational lectures, yoga, meditation and creative aging. We've also continued to provide case management, telephone reassurance, counseling, ESL, citizenship classes among other programs which are much needed during this time. Despite dire circumstances and budget cuts, we have worked hard to provide these services to the South Asian community during the pandemic. We have seen firsthand a lot of the struggles our community has faced. Our seniors are low to no income, low English proficient and face dire food security, especially during this pandemic, which further exacerbated their vulnerability as older adults, as people of color and as immigrants. Many of our clients have expressed that they are worried and fearful about their immigration status and reluctant to get tested for COVID-19 because of this. Many of our seniors depend on family members who lost their jobs at overwhelmingly high rates. And due to their immigration status, they're not eligible for government benefits, unemployment insurance benefits, and we're not eligible for the federal stimulus check either. Even for those applying for citizenship who could have become eligible, the pandemic put their citizenship application process on halt. Furthermore, despite these dire circumstances, the ICE rates continue to happen and inhumane deportation continue to take place, which resulted in complete disruptions of family units and upheavals of our community. Given these vulnerabilities that the immigrant community is currently facing, we need the city's help to protect and include immigrants in its COVID-19 response. India Home makes the following recommendations to pass the resolutions proposed today by the chair and to further emphasize, halt all deportation proceedings for the length of the COVID-19 pandemic, provide relief for those in the immigrant community on employment-based status who lost their jobs and their dependent family members, and support immigrant-serving grassroots organizations. As Chairman Chaka emphasized earlier today, immigrant communities are coming to CBOs as a first point of contact for all of their issues. And um, you know, please do continue to support organizations such as ours. Um, to better serve the vulnerable immigrant aging community with crucial resources. Thank you, and we hope we have your support to stabilize um, our community. Thanks. Thank you, Sharanya. Thank you for your testimony. Next, we will hear from G. Hay Fisher. You may begin when you are ready. Starting time. I would like to thank the City Council and the Committee on Immigration, immigration for the opportunity to testify. My name is Gia Fisher and I'm the executive director of the Korean American Family Service Center. KFSC provides social services to the immigrant survivors and their children. All our programs and services are offered in a culturally and linguistically appropriate setting. Our immigrant survivors are impacted and further traumatized by policies and responses that excluded them from emergency relief efforts. Many of our survivors are undocumented and are excluded from accessing unemployment insurance and all other income supports. They lost financial means, some temporarily, others permanently, resulting in loss of livelihood and un unable to support themselves and their children. These consequences are exacerbated as they are ineligible for unemployment benefits and other labor protection by law from which they are excluded. Many in our community and their loved ones have 
contracted the virus and passed away. Without financial means, our immigrant survivors can afford food, rent, basic necessity, personal protective equipment and supplies, medical care, or basic living expenses, phone, internet, utility bills. I would like to share um, our clients, one of our client stories. Ms. M successfully graduated from our long-term transitional housing program last December after escaping an abusive relationship. With KFS's support, she secured permanent housing and a job as a nail technician. She felt empowered to lead an independent life and raise her nine-year-old son as a single mom. However, the recent COVID-19 pandemic changed her life upside down. Unemployed, distressed by her financial hardship, she felt hopeless and constantly worried for her and her son's future. As an immigrant with a permanent residency, she is free to apply for public benefits that are available to due to public charge. She called KFSC's 24 hour hotline to seek support. We were able to provide her and her child with food, rental subsidy, as well as other basic necessities temporarily. This is one of many daunting stories we're encountering daily. And KFSC continues to ensure support for clients like Ms. M during this unprecedented time. KFSC saw a 300% increase in call volume on our 24-hour hotline. 88% were related to domestic violence, sexual assault, and child abuse. The remaining were all COVID-19 related. Callers would ask if we had food to donate or to simply say, I am so hungry, um, and ask for information, um, COVID-19 related information. We I'm urgently inspired. ask our council members on Committee on Immigration to take proactive measures to support the immigrant community and make immediate changes to ensure that the immigrant New Yorkers that are the heartbeat of the city are fully included in COVID-19 response efforts. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next, we will hear from Francis Wong. You may begin your when you are ready. Your time will begin now. Thank you, Chairman Chaka and members of the City Council for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Francis Huang. I use they, them pronouns, and I am the Policy Associate at Chinese American Planning Council, or CPC. CPC's mission is to promote social and economic empowerment of Chinese American immigrant and low-income communities. CPC is the largest Asian American social services organization in the US, and we provide vital resources to more than 60,000 people per year through more than 50 programs at 30 sites across Manhattan, Brooklyn, and Queens. CPC employs over 700 staff whose comprehensive services are linguistically accessible, culturally sensitive, and highly effective in reaching low-income and immigrant individual families. Today, I am calling, uh, CPC is calling on the city council to not only treat healthcare as a right, but also intentionally allocate money to fund, to build more comprehensive infrastructure for healthcare that funds immigrant and AAPI healthcare services equitably. What we are seeing is that AAPIs are, they make up, as folks were saying before, 15 to 16% of New York City's population yet receive less than 4% of the city's funding. In this healthcare system, we see that this translates to a lack of medical staff that represent and understand our community members, a lack of training um, to support recent immigrants as they navigate through the healthcare system, and a lack of cultural humility in every single level of the medical infrastructure. The lack of disaggregated data also ends up obscuring the different health outcomes and needs experienced by different Asian groups in New York today. Um, health and financial data, they vary across different ethnic groups and suggest very different approaches to healthcare services. For example, up to 17% of Koreans in New York are uninsured compared to 11% of Chinese um, immigrants. And South Asian New Yorkers are at a higher risk for diabetes and hypertension compared to Chinese New Yorkers. And what we have also seen is that um, 
due to the expansion of the public charge rule and the lift of the public charge injunction, we have heard cases of H&H &H workers asking our community members to apply for Medicaid first, regardless of immigration status, which then deters undocumented community members from uh, either applying to Medicaid or returning to H&H &H at all because of public charge concerns. And we have seen that especially during the chilling effect, many of our community members are already calling us to ask if they can disenroll in, um, from their benefits due to the public charge. And of course, COVID-19 has ex exacerbated all of this situation, leaving many immigrants to choose between their health and paying for rent and food. What, to combat the COVID-19 pandemic, CPC, we have been providing free meal distribution uh, weekly. Your, your time is up. Lower East Side in Brooklyn, and even though our staff are working tirelessly to provide food, it is not enough. There are reports of groceries rotting, culturally appropriate foods are rarely available, and if they are, it's the same dish every week, and the lines are wrapping around the block. In our Nanshan Senior Center in Flushing, the seniors are, are on a rotation system due to overwhelming demand, meaning they receive a free meal maybe once every three to four weeks. So what we are seeing is that there is a high demand for food and undocumented and low-income immigrants are left out of the COVID-19 response. And as well as that, um, our staff are over capacity and become the interpretation and cultural navigators for all types of services. So thank you again today to the Immigration Committee and Chairman Chaka for letting us testify. And I'm open to any questions. Thank you, Francis. And I just want to say one thing. Um, uh, thank you for the work. You're an example of a partnership with our office. Grow NYC and you all uh, were, were trying our, our best to support the food piece. I know there's somebody else in, in, in the probably the next panel, Whitney, who's connected to the South Brooklyn mutual aid uh, work. And uh, all I want to say is that the, the administration uh, testified to the cultural responsive food and the commitment to that. And so I wanna make sure that we follow up with them. And, and, and one question I have right now is, is there a mayor, uh, is there a Moya representative on this call, on this Zoom still? Can you just identify yourself? I just wanna make sure you're here. And I don't know how we do that exactly, but if there's a raising hand function, I just wanna make sure that there's a mayor, Martin Kim, okay. Uh, I think that, is that the mayor's office person? Okay, great. So we do have a mayor's office person. Let's just make sure that these are the kind of things that we're gonna follow up on. So thank you for your, your testimony. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, not seeing any other council member questions. So we will move on to our next panel. I'd like to now welcome Andrew Ochoa to testify. Uh, after Andrew Ochoa, we will have Zachary Ahmed Jose Tapa, Karina Kaufman Gutierrez, Whitney Hugh, and then Sarah L. Elsebai. Um, Andrew Ochoa, you may begin when you are ready. Your time will begin. Good afternoon. My name is Andrew Ochoa, and I'm program coordinator with Hispanic Federation. I would like to thank Chairman Chaka and all committee members for bringing us together today to discuss the COVID-19 response and how it pertains to our immigrant community. From barriers to accessing healthcare, job and income loss, and food and housing insecurity, immigrant New Yorkers remain the most vulnerable and the least protected to the effects of this pandemic while serving on the front line as essential workers. In the face of these unprecedented challenges, Hispanic Federation has committed over $13 million through our COVID-19 relief fund to directly address these concerns. However, significant need remains in our community. Federal initiatives have largely excluded immigrants, particularly the undocumented, from receiving much needed aid. While local city funding efforts are a positive step to addressing inequities, much work is needed to adequately meet the overwhelming challenges faced by our immigrant New Yorkers. Based on our, based on our daily work and conversations with immigrant community members who continue to express heightened fear dire need and a lack of available information, our recommendations are the following. Expanding the commitment of city funding towards emergency cash assistance programs, 
ideally upfront funding as noted by Alba from NMCIR, strengthening culturally and linguistically responsive contact tracing, increasing multilingual outreach, empowering uninsured immigrants to access free coronavirus testing. And as Matt, Manny from uh, NICE highlighted, we recommend ensuring the promotion of mental health services to all New Yorkers, regardless of immigration status, as well as prioritizing cultural competence training to help mitigate the increased mortality rate of immigrants and people of color. In addition to emphasizing multilingual outreach regarding New York City tenant and eviction protections, we also support continued expansion of food pantries, all city feeding programs, and increasing food allowances for all emergency housing programs. Thank you for your time. Hispanic Federation is here to serve and is happy to work with the New York City Council to protect immigrant New Yorkers during the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you for your testimony. Next, we will be hearing from Zachary Ahmed. You may begin when you are ready. Your time will begin. Thank you. My name is Zachary Ahmed and I'm a policy counsel at the New York Civil Liberties Union. I wanna thank the committee for holding this hearing and for the opportunity to testify. The federal government's response to COVID-19 has been a failure of leadership on multiple levels and the way in which immigrants have been neglected and mistreated in that response has been shaped. As we all know, immigrants make up a large proportion of what many call essential workers, risking their lives each day to provide others with necessary services, yet many have been left out of the relief packages passed by Congress for reasons related to their immigration status. At the same time, the Trump administration has continued to aggressively pursue its anti-immigrant agenda, conducting raids, continuing to detain people and transfer them across the country, and creating an overall atmosphere of, atmosphere of fear that grips many immigrant communities. So we commend the City Council and the Immigration Committee for using its voice to call attention to the situation and with the resolutions on today's agenda, urge the federal government to take action and the state to open up new avenues. In particular, we join the call for our state legislature to pass and the governor to sign Assembly Bill 10433 and Senate Bill 5167, which would remove any legal barrier that might restrict the city's ability to offer its own relief to its immigrant residents who've been left out of federal measures and create new opportunities for local action. We also welcome what is substantially outlined in the several resolutions calling for federal action, including halting the de deportation process and providing stability for people with employment-based status. Yet we also recognize that the measures outlined here represent the minimum of what the federal government can and should do in this moment. And so I want to take, I want to lift up a few additional measures that I, that the council could and should use its influence to advance at the federal level. First, Congress needs to ensure that all COVID testing and treatment is covered by emergency Medicaid. The COVID relief packages passed by Congress to date have largely left in place immigrant eligibility restrictions that affect millions, including DACA and TPS recipients. And while New York has taken measures to expand coverage for testing and treatment access under state emergency Medicaid, it's imperative that Congress also take action to eliminate any confusion, ensure continuity, and make sure that any gaps are filled. Second, cash assistance through tax rebates like those that many received earlier this year must be made available to all taxpayers. Under prior legislation, only those with social security numbers were eligible to receive relief, leaving out many people, including many essential workers who filed their taxes using an I-10, as well as many joint filers. That needs to be expanded. Third, Congress must pass legislation to mandate automatic renewals of work authorization for non-immigrant visa holders and DACA and TPS recipients. Many work authorized people nearing their renewal dates are at, are at risk of having their authorization lapse due to backlogs at USCIS and the continuing looming threat of furloughs. Automatic extensions would ease the burden for thousands of families. Finally, and of critical importance, all ICE enforcement actions must be halted as long as the COVID-19 pandemic persists and people in ICE detention must be released. Your time is up. Halting the deportation process is one important measure, but that must go hand in hand with an end to raids and a disruption of the immigration detention system that already detains thousands, causing a public health catastrophe. So we encourage the council to use its voice and influence to continue pushing for these and other federal actions. Thank you for the committee's time. Thank, Thank you for your testimony. Next, we will be calling on Whitney Hugh followed by Jose Chapa, followed by Karina Kaufman Gutierrez. Whitney Hu? 
you may begin. Hi, um, my name is Whitney Hu, and I am one of the founders and organizers of South Brooklyn Mutual Aid. Um, we're a group that started right after um, the pandemic, uh, and we serve primarily undocumented immigrants across Sunset Park, um, Bay Ridge, and Bensonhurst. Um, appreciative of the council for making space for this and for Chairman Chaka for inviting us to testify. I'm not going to lie, my, my review of the city's response to food, especially for those within our communities was atrocious. It was negligence, it was, if anything, cruel. Um, we were seeing at the peak of the pandemic, hundreds of families requesting and asking for food, asking for diapers, because what they found with the city's meals and system was incredibly hard to understand, hard to navigate, or were often cold meals, and that's not enough to help a baby from not crying at night. We had mothers calling us asking to set up payment plans to pay for their children. We had seniors asking for better food than applesauce and chips. And it is six months later, and I have not seen the food increase or, or change. If anything, I have instead seen the food czar do a lot of kind of photo ops with electeds in different communities instead of actually reaching out to those on the ground. I work with a lot of mutual aids across the city and we have still not seen actual direct outreach from the city. Instead, what we're seeing is neoliberalism where we're expected to serve and continue to work while the government and private partners are able to make money and to smile and to feel good. And that is unacceptable. While we are serving a need and crisis, we should not be the end all result. We are also now working with churches and organizations, including those like Workers' Justice Project, Chinese American Planning Council to continue to try to fight and serve those on the ground. Um, this also extends over to schools. We just did a back to school program and we had more parents show up with iPads, uncertain about how to actually access or get them ready to get their school, to get their children on. Um, rent, jobs, these are all things that I feel like are continually ignored as a city focuses more about reopening. Um, from the perspective of what we're seeing on the ground, things aren't changing just because we've reopened up some restaurants and some businesses. We're still seeing numbers increase. And right now we're even seeing white families show up as unemployment has gone out. Um, there's a church in South Brooklyn that is seeing sometimes 800 families a day. Um, and while he's reached out to the council and to others, he hasn't seen any actual long-term food um, support. Um, I think for what we're seeing right now is this idea of recovery seems really silly when we're still in crisis. Thank you so much. Thank you, Whitney. Thank you for your testimony. Next, we will hear from Jose Chapa. You may begin when you are ready. Your time will begin. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you to Council Member uh, Menchaca and the Committee on Immigration on holding this public hearing to address the urgent need to ensure that our response to COVID-19 includes everyone, especially those who have been significantly impacted. My name is Jose Chapa and I'm the Senior Policy Associate at the Immigrant Defense Project. IDP is an organization that works to secure fairness and justice for immigrants across the United States. We help lay the groundwork for a day when the criminal and immigration laws of the United States respect and uphold the human rights of everyone. We expect we speak today in support of the resolutions that seek to address the harms of the exclusionary immigration policies and ICE policing and deportation practices that have further marginalized immigrant community members during a global pandemic. We also want to bring attention to two state bills that are related to immigrant communities and COVID-19 that both passed the New York State Legislature this session and are awaiting the governor's signature. The Protect Our Courts Act, Senate Bill 425, and the Contact Tracing Confidentiality Act, Senate Bill 8450. In April 2019, the Immigration Committee passed Resolution Number 828, 
in calling for the New York State Legislature to pass and governor and the governor to sign the Protect Our Courts Act. Given that the courts have begun to reopen, it is critical that the governor signs this bill into law to ensure that everyone has equal access and protections from courts. Not only have undocumented immigrants been excluded from economic relief, they are further mar marginalized from accessing rights and remedies such as due process rights, orders of protection, and fighting eviction. Available through the court system where ICE targets people for arrest. ICE's practices during the pandemic continued to con continuing raids while COVID-19 was ravaging communities across the state. Uh, refusing to release people in detention and deporting people with COVID makes crystal clear that ICE has little regard for human health and safety. On September 1st, ICE announced that it had conducted a national operation arresting more than 2,000 people, 80 of, 83 of them in New York City. New York has been in ICE's crosshairs for years, and its targeting of our state increased dramatically in the months leading up to the current shutdown. Notably, ICE operations increased 400% in New York in the first 11 weeks of 2020, as compared to the last four weeks of the previous year, only to be slowed down by COVID-19. ICE's aggressive targeting of New Yorkers also heightens the urgency for the governor to sign the contact tracing confidentiality bill, which states that emergency uh, of states of, of emergency have historically provide, provided a ripe opportunity for governments and, and police to expand their surveillance powers over whoever is considered to be a threat, most recently black and brown communities, including immigrants. And it is critical that New York State does not allow management of the pandemic to expand the surveillance state. By passing this law, the governor will ensure that information provided through contact tracing cannot be weaponized by the NYPD, ICE, or other policing agencies. We bear witness to the devastation immigrant communities have endured because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Immigrant neighborhoods have been at the epicenter of the outbreak and experienced massive loss of lives and instability. Brooklyn, along with Queens and the Bronx, and in particular, the immigrant neighborhoods of the Bronx, have been among the, those hit with the hardest by COVID-19 in the country. Um, many, we will not forget that there were freezer trucks lined up in the parking lots, including in Sunset Park, serving as makeshift morgues. Many of our constituents reached out to you asking you to uh, take care of uh, sick loved ones because they are trying to put food on the table. Uh, thankfully, the legislature has been presented with a clear solution. We urge you to call on the governor to sign the Protect Our Courts Act and contract tracing confidentiality bill. Uh, I will submit the rest of this uh, through email. Thank you so much. Thank you, Osa. Thank you for your testimony. Next, we'll hear from Karina Kaufman Gutierrez. You may begin when you are ready. Your time will begin now. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Councilmember Menchaca, and to the Committee on Immigration for your time today and holding this important hearing. Um, my name is Karina Kaufman Gutierrez, and I'm the Deputy Director of the Street Vendor Project of the Urban Justice Center. Um, there are approximately 20,000 New Yorkers who sell food and merchandise from the streets and sidewalks of New York City. 90% of the Street Vendor Project's members are low-wage immigrant workers who rely on busy streets in order to survive and are reporting income losses of 70 to 90% and in fact are still being heavily fined for minor violations. Two of our members in Lower Manhattan received fines of up to $500 this week from the NYPD and the Department of Health. One for not having their license showing right here, and one for having a box outside of their food cart, and one for being too close to the sidewalk. Street vendors have been excluded from disaster relief at every level of government, and our members, Nabil and Assam, have no idea how they're going to pay these fines when they make $3 for each plate that they serve, and that needs to go to rent first. Um, we ask for city council to prioritize the recovery of immigrant owned small businesses that make our city great. As small business owners and workers, annually street vendors contribute about $293 million to the city's economy. Yet city, state, and federal government sponsored relief programs have excluded informal businesses like street vendors due to rigorous technological and documentation requirements. But perhaps the biggest barrier is the lack of a social security number. A significant number of street vendors are undocumented, which means they don't even qualify for unemployment benefits despite collecting and paying sales tax, just like any other business. 
New York City immigrant owned small businesses comprise 48% of our city's roughly 220,000 small businesses. The short term solution that's needed um, for the current financial hardship that street vendors are facing is an immediate response from the city creating granting programs that suit street vendors as sole proprietors of their businesses, regardless of their immigration status. And the long-term solution for vending is fixing the unfair system, lifting the cap on permits and licenses, and enabling street vendors to legally operate their viable businesses, creating job opportunities for immigrant communities, and generating tax revenue for the city by passing intro 1116 as soon as possible. This will alleviate the high rental fees of up to $25,000 that vendors must pay in order to avoid harassment and potential confiscation of their goods. In the meantime, the Street Vendor Project has been focusing on creating job opportunities for street vendors by finding funding to hire street vendors to make meals for food distribution with many of the organizations who are on this call. Communities they are a part of with culturally sensitive food. We would love to work with the city to scale up this operation to hire more street vendors to contribute to food and security efforts. Um, thank you for your attention to this the and thank you, for your, thank you to the committee for your time. It's a great idea. I'd love to do that. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, now we will hear from Sarah L. Elsebay. You may begin when you are ready. Good afternoon, now. everyone. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Maneka, members of the Committee on Immigration. I want to thank you all for the opportunity to testify before you today. My name is Sarah El Sabai, and I am an immigration navigator at the Arab American Association of New York. I would like to start uh, by reinforcing the testimony of other organizations. I can say that the challenges faced by New York's uh, Arab, uh, American, Arab community and Arab American community today are the most intense. Uh, our organization has seen in the 20 years since our founding. These challenges are particularly acute for Arab Americans uh, whose immigration status is unsettled. The solutions being discussed today will have all meaningful impacts for tens of thousands of New Yorkers, ensuring that immigrants will not have, uh, they will not have to fear seeing their immigration case jeopardized as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic or any other future ones like it. In particular though, I would like to address the importance of resolution 1399-2020, uh, addressing access to state and local benefits regardless of immigration status. This, resol this resolution, if brought into law, uh, would have life-changing impacts for some of New York's neediest families. In my casework, uh, with my clients and in our organization's role distributing direct relief throughout the, this crisis, the impact of exclusion from state and local benefits for, for immigrant families has become incredibly clear. It, exclusion from be, uh, public benefits has left thousands of families who have lost income due to COVID-19 without even the limited resource uh, and support afforded to those with settled immigra immigration status. Uh, this puts them into a debt, tra uh, a debt trap. They will be hard. Um, they will be hard pressed to escape after this crisis is over. Um, and already, there are thousands of families across our city with no means to provide for themselves, who who no access to relief as a result of their immigration status. Uh, background and growing household debt are burdens that grow heavier for these families every day. And with winter and the threat of another re re resurgence of the panda pandemic on the horizon, there is no relief in sight, um, unfortunately. So for too many families, the only thing standing between them and homelessness right now is the ongoing eviction ban. Even when the city emerges from the pandemic, the depths incurred to survive it by immigrant families will likely to be, uh, to be too much to bear for too many with um, catastrophic consequences for tens of thousands of New Yorkers. <clears throat> uh, resolution 1399-2020, if passed, will not solve all of the problems faced by immigrant families, but it will provide significant help. Access to unemployment benefits and other means of financial help can help alleviate the looming debt crisis immigrant families are facing, um, saving many from Your bankruptcy and homelessness. Up. 
immigrant families need significantly more support than these resolutions provide uh, for them, but the protections these resolutions would provide are, uh, are an essential step. Arab uh, New Yorkers are far from the largest immigrant group in the city, uh, but through the COVID-19 pandemic, we have found ourselves playing an outsized role in supporting our city. From the hospitals keeping our neighbors alive to the bodegas keeping them fed, uh, over the last five months, Arab New Yorkers have been on the front lines fight, fighting for New York City, demonstrating the values central to Arab culture and Islamic faith, charity, self-sacrifice, and duty to our community. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you for your testimony. Um, if at this time, this ends our public panel section, if we have inadvertently missed anyone that is registered to testify today and is yet to be called, please use the Zoom raise hand function now and you will be called, on, called in order. Seeing no hands, I'm now gonna turn it over to Chairman Chaka for closing remarks. Chairman Chaka. Thank you. Uh, I wanna thank all the staff for the incredible work. I know you probably already know this. Uh, there is a massive invisible team that makes this Zoom hearing happen. So I wanna say thank you to all of you, all those, all, all those of you who interpreted on behalf of New Yorkers uh, who were speaking in their language. This panel or this hearing started with uh, four New Yorkers that spoke their story about the need for government to step up. And I just wanna think about them right now as we heard from the mayor's office and all of you who are technicians in this recovery and response what I'm learning here more, more than ever is the importance of your work and the institutionalization of this, ra this, this response, this crisis response. And so for me, what I wanna make sure you know is that we're gonna to continue to work together to build that resource and capacity building that you need. Um, the city can't have uh, an immigrant plan without you. The city can't do this alone because that's not how it works. Immigrants have relationships with all of you who are doing the work, whether it's legal, healthcare, mutual aid, uh, et cetera. And, and so we, I know that, you know that, but that needs to be integrated into everything that we do in this next budget, everything we do to push the state to do the right thing and Congress. And I know that a lot of us aren't necessarily feeling uh, good about what Congress is doing right now, but we have to stay uh, loud and vigilant. And so with that, um, I I'm hoping that with, uh, I think Martin Kim is here, that we work with the administration to pivot and focus on these issues that were brought up here. And I'm gonna make a commitment to work with, and I think Whitney said this, uh, with other mutual aid groups that are trying to do their best and ensure that they get the focus that they need from the city agencies. And so, um, Lorena and Caesar on my team, let's figure out a way to do a citywide conversation with mutual aid groups to bring them in. Let's talk to them. And let's figure out how they're engaging immigrants and ensuring that the mayor's office of immigrant affairs is working directly with them. Uh, that's what we do here in this committee. We hold people accountable. We hold our agencies accountable. Uh, and that's because you are, all, you are all on the ground seeing what you're seeing and bringing that to us. So thank you uh, to our community staff our, our committee staff and all of you for this hearing. And I hope you stay safe. And um, I, probably a lot of you have been sitting like me, so I hope you can do some stretches, uh, some yoga stretches just to get back into your body. Um, take care of yourself and your heart. Thank you. And now call this hearing uh, to an end.